Good morning, everyone. This the um, regular March 1st, 2023 meeting of the Nags Head Board of Commissioners is hereby called to order. I'll ask if you all please join me in a few moments of silence. Now, if you'll stand as you're able and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. thank all of y'all for being here today this is the biggest crowd we've had uh, <laughs> and uh, appreciate your, your your patience and understanding of our uh, accommodations I do want to point out with this many people in the room there's an exit where you came in there's an exit on this side in case of uh, an emergency um, so the uh, first order of business on our uh, agenda is the adoption of the agenda and I believe there's a Modification. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a uh, motion to adopt agenda with the modification of a closed session hearing to discuss uh, real property at the end of the meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda as amended. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, that brings us to uh, recognitions, and we'll start with um, Town Engineer David Ryan. Nancy, good morning. Good morning. How is everybody today? Thank you. Good morning. Um, I would like to recognize David Ryan for his 10 years of service with the town of Nags Head. David is a dedicated employee and has the town's best interests in all he does. This is proven daily in his work and his work ethic. David is a thorough fact finder and an eloquent speaker. <laughs> he is not at 8.30 to 5.00. Monday through Friday kind of guy. David does and has done what it takes when it comes to ensure a project continues on the right path. David provides day-to-day -day technical assistance regarding the town's infrastructure, water lines, streets, pedestrian safety improvements, drainage and wastewater. He is a key staff member in the current grant procurement working group and is on the pedestrian planning committee. David was lead in developing the Beach Nourishment Master Plan and the 13 Project Stormwater Capital <coughs> Improvement Plan. I would like to mention a few of the projects that David has been responsible for. These projects include designing, permitting, bidding, and construction assistance. Dowdy Park, US 158 Multi-Use Path, Nags Head Acres Groundwater lowering system, red drum drainage improvements, village of Nags Head French drain and associated improvements, South Memorial <coughs> drainage repairs, wind jammer to Villa Dunes <coughs> Wild Waterline, which goes through Jockey's Ridge, Bonnet Street to Baltic Street Waterline on the east side of 158 Bypass, and the Deering to Soundside Road Waterline. Numerous beach excesses. Other projects David has been taking the lead role in has been the Bonnet Street bathhouse replacement, south end of Old Nags Head Cove AC waterline replacement, and the 2019 and the 2022 beach nourishment, and several dune management projects that involve fencing and sprigging. David lives in Manio with his wife Cheryl and his son Liam. In his spare time, or when he's resting, he's the project coordinator for the new Public Works Service Complex. <laughs> <laughs> David Ryan, thank you. Thank you, David, for those years of service. Uh, 
the next, next I'll call on our police chief for a recognition for 15 years of service. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. <clears throat> I will have to say, um, when Sergeant Hobson got here this morning, I <clears throat> saw all the people in the room and I told them they were all here for him. So, <laughs> 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 on a serious note, it's, it's my pleasure to come before you today to recognize Sergeant Vince Hobson for 15 years of service with the town. Uh, Vince joined our agency in 2008 as a patrol officer and worked his way to sergeant in 2013. He has a master's in social science with concentrations in criminal justice and sociology from Appalachian State. He is also certified as a general instructor with the agency with specialized instruction for firearms, physical fitness, standardized field sobriety testing, specialized explosives, and hazmats. Vince also serves as an adjunct instructor with the College of Albemarle and teaches with their criminal justice curriculum along with teaching prospects in their BLET program. He has also completed his traffic certificate and tactical certificate programs through the North Carolina Justice Academy. Vince is very dedicated to the department and always steps up to assist those with questions or issues before him. He always can be counted on to fill open shifts and assist in many off-duty events that are within the town. Vince is a true asset to the town and our department. In his off time, when he's not teaching, he enjoys spending time with his wife, Marissa, and his daughter, Kaylee. <coughs> Kylie, excuse me. Vince, congratulations on your 15 years of service. <laughs> The next item on our agenda is a presentation from the Arts and Culture Committee. I'll call on Paige Griffin. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners and guests. Uh, this morning what we're going to do is review a little bit about what happened this past year and then look forward to big ask and um, <laughs> hopes and dreams for next year. Um, the stats from this last year, uh, we did have two markets again, um, and 56 vendors were part of our summer markets. 27 of those were consumables. Uh, there were three new ones this year. We had uh, Gutsy Grain, um, Char's Coffee from over in Manio, and then Donna's Desserts, and they were welcome to our consumable group. It seems to be that we are growing um, in the consumables. Remember in the beginning, five, six years ago when we started, we were more heavy on the artisans, but we're equaling out now, which is, which is pleasant. And it's also good for the economy as far as um, weekly shoppers. We continue to draw people from our 75 mile radius with our vendors, from um, Columbia, Swan Quarter, Edenton, Hertford, um, and Elizabeth City, so they do travel. Most of our day trippers also come from those areas, and then we also draw from the um, tourists that are here during the summer. Our advertising for the market this past year, we solely use Instagram and uh, Facebook. I did not spend um, many dollars, I think it was less than 100 on advertising, and that's our posters. These are some of the other vendors. Uh, that's Modern Coastal Cookery. Um, that is Painted Turtle. Abby's Teas, which is also a new uh, vendor to us. And then Two Jam Good. Our holiday markets, we had about 75 vendors this year. Uh, three Saturday markets and then one Thursday night market. Our Thursday night market is our festival, if you will, our almost like a festival of lights. Um, everybody decks out their own tent and area and um, becomes a fun event with music and holiday spirit. The fees generated between the two years, two, 2021, our fees were in the 21, it's 21,900 um, and due to um, the drop in vendors for our summer market, we saw an increase in vendors in the holiday markets. And so it equaled out our uh, intake for 2022 was 21,100, so very similar. 
These were some of our holiday happenings. Uh, we had the annual tree lighting. It was our second one. We're continuing to grow that. Uh, we did the townwide decorating contest. Ironically, not many um, residents participated. It was mainly businesses. So we're hoping to uh, spread that this next year and have some residents participate. And then flashlight candy cane hunt was a huge success. I uh, expected about 50 to 75 children. We had 48 in the two to five year olds. So you talk about controlled chaos, that's <laughs> what that was for sure. But it was a lot of fun. We've gotten great feedback and plan to uh, offer that again this next year. Some of the other things we did this past year, we had several movies on the lawn. We continued with our summer concert series. Um, we did morning fitness. Village Realty sponsored that for us. And that ran all the way through October. Uh, we also entertained um, the Mended Wing Theater Company. This was more for adults, um, but it was well received and hope to have them back again twice this next year. And then we also um, had a kids day. It was kind of like a back to school. So this next year, we would like to do 10 markets um, starting, we are driven now by the school calendar due to parking. And so we have to go with what uh, Nags Head Elementary allows us to use their parking lot. The dates for this year are uh, June 15th through August 17th. The vendor fee will remain the same. Um, typically, we average about 50 50 to 55, because we'll also do our Young Entrepreneurial Program this year. If you recall, that's where we take um, kids in middle school and high school. They go through a series of classes with me, and then they create their brand, they create uh, prices, we work on um, their displays for their tables, and we also go over their spiel, how to connect with people, how to tell their story. Um, so we're gonna uh, continue with that program again, and then we'll also have a space for community partners. Some of those this past year were SPCA, Endless Possibilities, Beach Food Pantry, the hospital, Dare County Health. We had about 10 different, um, and Nest, 10 different this past year. The summer concert series will continue with 10. That is a Wednesday night from 6.30 to 8. Um, Looking to increase traffic with the tree lighting ceremony, the holiday decorating, and the candy cane hunt that we talked about. The two last things on this list are one um, I'd like to bring your attention to because one of the reasons, um, one of the reasons I think I got full time this past year was because we talked about winter markets, and I couldn't do that uh, because of my other job. However, when you graciously offered full time, I accepted. One of the things that we had talked about with vendors was doing winter markets. And so, uh, second Saturdays for uh, January through April, we would like to give that opportunity to our vendors. Specifically consumables, um, because of the lack that they have to uh, show their wares to continue their perishable items during those winter months. And then the second big ask is um, a night market on Tuesdays. I call it a night market, but really in my mind and in the mind of the Arts and Cultural Committee, which I also serve, it will be more of a family-friendly event. Uh, I grew up in circus tent era, and um, it won't be like that, but we had ice cream, we had puppet shows, there was there's always a message and there was always music. And so somehow I see that coming into shape for that family, fun, friendly event on Tuesday nights. So that's my second big ask for this next year. Thank you. Uh, these are the continued opportunities for this next year. We would like to do yoga again. We have reached out. Um, we are looking for sponsors um, for the movies and um, a kid's day again. Fire was very gracious in working with us this past year. Um, police will come on board hopefully again this next year. 
And then um, the last picture at the bottom, these are, um, it's a sidewalk pedestrian. The way that we have talked about it is um, possibly in the market area with uh, in between Bonnet Street. And these have been shown in research to slow people down. Uh, we talked about the beach road, but figure we need to start someplace else before uh, we, we go big. So we're hoping um, to work with public services and um, figure out how to make this work in the market area. Also on that list is the Storytelling Festival. This is one of the um, activities the Arts and Culture Committee would like to see. Um, it is known that each of us receive about 100,000 words a day. You, your brain processes and remembers those words if they're images. 60 times faster you remember those words. So images for storytelling festival is something that they're interested in, uh, so we're going to pursue that. And then my last is a big thank you. I, um, I've only been here full time for about seven months, and what a ride it's been from going from part time to full time to see the opportunities that we've been allowed to provide for the community, how they have come around, um, how easy it's been to work with public services, fire, and police, um, how truly it's become a culmination of all of um, the town departments working together. It has definitely been strengthened. Um, so I appreciate that and thank you for that. Um, you know, I was reading an article the other day about public spaces and how open public spaces, there was a big push during COVID, obviously, but how they allow people to express themselves, how they allow free um, expression, how they build confidence, how they build social communities and connect people to people. And that is truly you know what it is all about and what we are doing when we spend this money at Dowdy. And I realized this morning we've talked a lot about Dowdy. Um, there is in the works funding um, pending grants for Whalebone and also Satterfield Dog Park. And once we get bathrooms at, at um, Whalebone, once we get some shade, then we will move activities to those places as well. So I look forward to that. Yep. So. Good. Any questions? Thank you. Commissioner Sears? No questions. Thank you for your work, Paige. Mr. Kane. Yeah. Mr. Kane. Thank you, Paige. You've done a great job. I admit that I was a skeptic a long time ago, but the park has turned out to be a wonderful asset to the town, and all the markets and stuff are doing great. They brought bring in so many people, not just from Nags Head, but other communities. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Sure. Right. Thank you. You know, I've talked to other mayors and commissioners from other towns, and, and they're very envious of Dowdy Park and what a success it has been, uh, what a landmark it is. It really has become part of the sort of the Nags Head brand. Um, I've had a couple of experiences where people have um, spoken to me and said they either rent a house near the park because their children enjoy it, or they uh, rent a house in the Christmas season near the park because they want to be part of the events that are around there. And, um, and so that's, it's a huge asset to the town and I'm excited to see, um, see it grow. So thank you, Commissioner Brinkley. Y'all stay very busy, but you do a great job. Thank you to you and the rest of the town staff that makes it so successful. Yeah, I, I agree, and I just hear from, from other vendors how well run that yeah. those events are and, and what a great job you're doing, and, and we appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Paige, and extend our thanks to your committee, uh, Arts and Culture, as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Peggy Saparito is actually here, okay. so hey, she's Peggy. our chair, thank so you. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item on our agenda is a um, Safety Week proclamation, and I'll call uh, Fire Marshal Height to the podium, please. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners. Thank you for allowing me to speak this morning for a few minutes about our safety week that we have coming up. Of course, you might ask in the beginning which week is safety week, and we recognize it as next week, but thankfully, 
our employees act in pretty safe manners all year round every week. Um, we show that by very low injury rates and accident rates in the town. So we're very appreciative of the support that you all give us and of the contribution that the employees make. But I've had the privilege of acting as a town safety officer for 10 years now. Um, and it is a privilege. I get to work with some extremely terrific people on our safety committees um, who meet regularly to talk and look at things that go on in the town, processes um, that we do, and things that we can do to make, make our jobs safer and make them better. Part of that is planning our safety week um, that we do annually, where we take a minute to step back, look at some areas for improvement, but also look at areas that not only are, provide safer means of work, but healthier means of work. So next week, um, we are planning our safety week starting on Monday. We're having the Department, Department of Labor will come in. They'll teach us uh, about general construction, the industry awareness, safety. Um, it's going to be really great for our employees. They'll get a certification at the end of that. We do some other things like snake, t uh, snake presentations and tick presentations. Helps with our employees that are out in the field to, to recognize things that could harm them. Uh, we do our audio, audio metric testing where each employee can go in and do hearing tests that hopefully can tell them if there's any problems or any exposures they've had. Uh, we even do some things as far as financial health, so to speak, and we'll have Civic Plus, Plus in uh, doing a presentation for us. One of the highlights of the week or, or one of the highlighted days, so to speak, is Thursday where we'll have CPR class and defensive driving. Um, and of course, CPR, I think we all can recognize is very good for anyone to know. Um, hopefully to save a life if needed, to be able to be aware of those skills and use them. Um, and then, of course, on Friday, we're going to end our week with a chili cook-off, <laughs> where each employee gets the opportunity, if they'd like or if they choose, to cook a pot of chili that will be judged upon by their peers. So I'm hopeful that we'll have a good turnout for all these events. I'm hopeful that you all can attend some of them. Um, but most of all, I'm extremely grateful and thankful that you all allow me to be in this position and that you allow me to recognize Safety Week, and Mayor, if you will, uh, I appreciate that if you have a resolution that you could adopt that as Safety Week, and I appreciate that, and yes. thank you very much. Thank you, and I'll read this first, a proclamation for Safety Week in the Town of Nags Head. Whereas the Town of Nags Head Board of Commissioners, employees, and citizens are committed to the maintenance of a safe and healthful workplace, and whereas the town has assumed an active role in the promotion of a safe and healthful work environment by a program of regular, regular occupational worksite evaluations and employee safety education, and whereas the town strives to stimulate and maintain the interest in loss control and accident prevention and recognizes past and future services to the employees and citizens of Nags Head, and whereas the town seeks to guide and encourage the adoption and institution of safe work practices by all employers and employees in Nags Head. Now, therefore, the Town of Nags Head Board of Commissioners does hereby proclaim March 6th through 10th, 2023, as Safety Week in the Town of Nags Head and commends this observance to our citizens. Furthermore, in recognition of this proclamation, I invite all Nags Head employees to attend the annual Nags Head Safety Luncheon Chili Cook-Off on Friday, May, March the 10th, 2023, from 12 noon to 2 p.m. at the Douglas A. Ramali Fire Station Number 16, this being the first day of March 2023. And a motion to adopt would be in order. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, sir. Thank you. That brings us to uh, public comment, and I will turn this over to Mr. Lighty. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, every month, the Board of Commissioners welcomes members of the public to provide comment to the Board. This is not an opportunity for dialogue, and the Board rarely responds to comment, but it is an opportunity to express concerns or matters of interest to the Board as a whole. Um, I will also point out that if you are here uh, to provide comment on the public hearing that we are having, you should wait until that public hearing to provide your comment. But if you wish to provide comment on anything else, this is your opportunity. If you will please start by going to the podium, telling us who you are, uh, and then address your comments to the board. And I will also be keeping the time, and I'll let you know when your five minutes is just about up. So who would like to go first? I'll jump in. All right.
Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Ellen Heatwall. I reside at 101 East Seagull Drive in South Nagset. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't think I was going to have to be back here, but here I am. Um, last year we had, and yes, it's been pretty much a year, that we had a push to get the dilapidated house off the beach um, in South Nagset. And um, I worked with very closely with our town manager, Andy Garman, gathered neighborhood support and finances to help in an effort to, um, to get um, Mr. Goldner, who owns the house, to uh, sell it to the town and take it down so that it is no longer a eyesore, a safety hazard, um, you know, falling apart and falling into the ocean. Um, I've been in touch with Andy at least every month uh, <laughs> since that time um, when we gave him a 90-day opportunity to, uh, to repair, uh, which was not possible uh, given the state of the building. And then at the end of September, that was Mr. Goldner had a county claim out. We're in March now, six months past the time of that 90 days and the um, Mr. Goldner's counterclaim and still nothing has been done um, to m the best of my knowledge. And I just, I have, I have to be here. I have to be the one that says, hey, don't forget about us and don't forget about this, this crazy um, eyesore and health and hazard on the beach. So I implore you to not put this on the back burner any longer. We're going to come up on an yet another season. The house was damaged beyond repair in November of 2009. I mean, we should be ser terribly <coughs> embarrassed by that. And so I implore you to please, please, please make this a top priority in the next month or two so we can get it off the beach before yet another season starts. And then just on another note, because why not, um, <laughs> um, there have been several uh, new signs along the roads in South Nagsed that says fine for dumping. And um, I guess a, a, you know, a funny question is, was it buy 12, get 12 free? Um, they are put like every 20 yards. And un unfortunately, it's doing exactly the opposite of what we want it to do. It make, it's making it look trashy. And I understand the objective of those signs was to um, get the homeowners to put any debris that they had in front of their house and not on South, o South Oregon Inlet. Um, but I think, um, honestly, I think a letter to all the homeowners explaining where they need to put that during the, the seasons of, of rubbish and debris collection uh, would have been, uh, would have <coughs> served the purpose perhaps better because I've talked to several neighbors that are like, well, wait, I thought we could do that. And now these signs are everywhere. And so that's my thoughts on that. And just a note, I don't know if she's still here, but the culture um, director, I love the idea of the uh, putting, putting um, artwork on the crosswalks. Um, I, think, um, I think another thing that the town has done, which I applaud, was um, but slightly overuse of the new stop sign stencil that you guys got. <laughs> slightly overused. <laughs> like it's everywhere you look up now on the streets. Thank you so much for your time. Please, please, please don't forget us in South Nags Head with this house. Please, let's get it down. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Heatwell. Next. If there's, if there's no other public comment at this time, we would close the public comment session. So um, unless everyone's here to comment for the public hearing, mm -hmm. we're going to conclude the public comment session at this time. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, the next item on our agenda then would be the consent agenda, uh, which you have before you, and a motion would be in order. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. <clears throat> and that brings us right back to you, John. The next <laughs> item on our agenda is, in fact, the public hearing. 
All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So at this time, we will begin the public hearing uh, for the board to consider uh, the adoption of various amendments to the Uni Unified Development Ordinance, uh, including a zoning map amendment and a rezoning of uh, property in the historic character area. Um, this matter is uh, the only public hearing that we have on the uh, agenda for today. We will begin the public hearing receiving the um, staff's analysis presented by the um, uh, planning director, um, Kelly Wyatt. Thank you. Um, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. I, I wish I could just let Mr. Lighty's intro be enough. <laughs> um, and so I've, I'll try to go through this as quickly as possible. It's a lot of information, as you can see by the download. Um, up here on the screen, but I'll go ahead and start out um, by saying that I'm here to present a series of text amendments to the UDO, the Unified Development Ordinance, and uh, a map amendment, which most people um, would call a rezoning. So uh, this effort began following the adoption of a moratorium on October 19th, 2022 by this board. The moratorium prohibited all non-residential development located within the C2 General Commercial District in the area from Danube Street north to Hollowell Street in between the highways, so in between NC12 and 158. It was at that time that planning staff and the planning board began working together to draft proposed regulations that would ensure the town's vision is maintained and the future development within the historic character area um, preserves and complements um, the area. The historic character area and the guiding principles for this effort really came from the town's comprehensive land use plan. It's a very large document. We had a lot of um, community input during the process of adopting the comprehensive plan uh, and that was done in 2017. Uh, if anyone's unfamiliar with the document or curious about the document, um, I'm happy to get it to you. Uh, you can also just go to the town's website. And I think at this point, um, it's right there on the front page. Um, so if you're interested, you can certainly find it that way. Um, planning staff worked with the planning board on this item over the course of three of their regularly scheduled meetings. Um, November, their November meeting, November 2022, December 2022, um, and then in January of 2023. At their first meeting, there was a focus on understanding the existing zoning regulations, reviewing the intent of the historic character area and the neighborhood's character area in light of the existing land uses that were already there. At their second meeting, which was in December of 2022, the planning board received feedback from interested property owners from um, within the historic Cottage Row area, as well as the Old Knacks Head Place subdivision. In both of these scenarios, the property owners expressed interest um, in that we give consideration uh, to residential zoning designations. Um, at this meeting, the planning board also began looking at potential map amendments based upon the existing zoning districts that we had um, available to us. Um, in doing that, both staff and the planning board realized that really the, the districts that were available, the commercial districts, the C1, C2, C3, C4, and CR, um, that none of those really captured the intent of the historic character area. And so staff went back to the drawing board and created a new zoning district. Um, which we're calling the C5, Commercial 5, um, Historic um, Character Commercial District. It was at their January meeting, the staff presented the draft ordinance amendments um, for the establishment of the C5 district and the associated map amendment, which um, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with. Um, so at this time, I would like to walk you through the amendments and as I said before, I apologize, it's cumbersome. I'll try to be concise and not go down many rabbit holes with it. Um, so let me first blow this up so that it's legible. Hope that the mouse cooperates with me. All right, so. Hmm. 
So here's, uh, here's the draft of the proposed text amendments. Um, this is just our um, initial page here where we set out the purpose and authority. This is also the area where we discuss uh, the 2017 Comprehensive Land Use Plan and um, the policies that um, guided this discussion concerning uh, the, the rezoning effort and the text amendment effort. So first up, uh, we have an amendment to section 6.2.2. Um, this is just a very straightforward chart, and we're just adding the C5, as you can see right here. And the mouse doesn't care for me anymore. All right, so next up is going to be section 6.2.4 commercial districts to include the C5, uh, the Historic Character Commercial District. Um, this is where we've created the intent narrative. Uh, you can see that. It's at the bottom of the paragraph there. States the Historic Character Commercial, the C5, is established uh, to accommodate neighborhood scale commercial and residential development patterns that are compatible with and protect the surrounding residential areas including historic Cottage Row. Um, then down below that, we sort of expand upon um, what that looks like. The next amendment that we have up is to section 6.6. .6. This is our table of uses and activities. Um, this is a, a <coughs> large document in and of itself. Um, looking at the screen now, you can see the chart, how it's set up. And you can see where we've added um, the C5 district. Um, and we, we did that in red, underline, highlight yellow. So you can just kind of use this as a matrix um, to see which uses are being proposed to be allowed within the, the C5 district um, and how they're proposed to be permitted. So when you see a, a P, that means that it's a permitted use and it's permitted by right. It's something that if you proposed, we could issue that permit in-house. Um, if you see an S beside it, it means that it's permitted, but by the special use process, which is a longer process. Um, it's a quasi-judicial process that many of you may be familiar with. Um, it's where the request is going to go to the planning board one month. Uh, they're going to make their recommendation, and we're going to set a public hearing, and then it will come to the board of commissioners. Um, and then if you see an R with either the, the P or the S, it just means that there's supplemental regulations associated with it. And um, it, you can go to the UDO and check that section and you'll see what those regulations actually are. Um, I won't go through this entire document. I hope that everyone has had a chance to look at it. I'll say right now, um, from the staff perspective, this was a very large undertaking and uh, I recognize that that what's here today isn't perfect and um, you know there, there very well could be uses uh, that, that we need to add to remove to amend <coughs> etc so um, but hopefully this is a good base uh, that we can that we can start with the next section um, that we amended with section 8.2, development standards. I apologize, Karen, it might take a while. <laughs> um, but this is the development standards within our primary districts, um, and it's to establish the dimensional requirements for the proposed C5 district. Um, you'll see, oh, here we go. Just maybe scroll down just a tad. There should be some red. Um, actually, just go down a little bit more. Almost. There we go. Perfect. So um, here's where we're setting out uh, the dimensional requirements for the C5. Uh, you look at the lot area. That's consistent with the C2 district, which I will say that the entire rezoning um, area from Danube to Hollowell between the highways that's currently zoned C2. So 
the dimensional standards um, for lot area are the same as uh, what's currently in the C2, as is um, lot width at 50 feet, the same with our front yard setbacks of 30 feet for residential, eight feet uh, side yard setbacks for residential, that's gonna be 15 feet for commercial. Um, you'll, you'll see a little footnote there that goes into more detail, which I don't have to do right now. Um, and then the rear yard setback, which is uh, 25 feet or 20% of the lot depth, um, but in no case should exceed 30. Um, our height is the same throughout the town, 35 feet. You can go to 42 if you have an 812 roof pitch on your structure. That last item is different. Um, what's proposed right now, it says 40% uh, lot coverage is permitted. Um, you'll see the footnote there, which if you um, go down and, and look at that in more detail, which um, we will, that, that speaks to an allowance to increase that 40% with the use of permeable paving materials. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll get there, but it, essentially it just says that lot area is going to be 40% or lot uh, coverage rather is going to be 40% of your lot area and you can increase it to 50% if you use a permeable paving material. So um, moving on, the next section is going to be section 7.15, there we go, pet shops. Um, this seems random, just sitting right there in the middle, um, but when you talk about uh, whether these uses had a P for permitted or an S for a special use, um, when staff and the planning board was looking at this and we saw pet shop and um, it was a it was a permitted use in the C2, um, but it included um, a pet shop, like the large retail pet shop that you would imagine, like a pet smart that's maybe going to have a, a vet clinic inside it, um, and grooming um, as well. So we wanted to amend that to say that we are recommending pet shops be allowed within the C5. Um, but only grooming. So if you could imagine just a, uh, a standalone shop or maybe a shop within an existing shopping center, um, that's for pet grooming only, but no boarding. So um, moving on down from there, uh, we're at section 8.3, special development standards. Um, and this is where a lot um, of the information relating to the C5 can be found. Um, it says where the requirements that are below are in conflict with the requirements of the UDO and other sections, then this section um, will supersede. So what you'll notice is we're proposing that uh, new commercial structures that are fronting NC12 not exceed 3,500 square feet of habitable building area um, just below that, uh, we're proposing that commercial structures on lots that are fronting US 158 shall not exceed 10,000 square feet of habitable building area. Then uh, below that, we're noting that we do have some lots that have frontage on both 12 and 158. And if that commercial structure is closer than 75 feet to NC 12, they're going to fall under that 3,500 square foot rule. But if the structure's further than 75 feet away from NC12, they're going to fall under that 10,000 square foot rule. And next up, uh, in addition, they have in addition to achieving uh, compliance with commercial design standards of the UDO, the Board of Commissioners must also make a finding that the proposed um, building design reflects the heritage of Old Nag's Head and does not diminish the unique architectural character of the Nags Head Beach Cottage Row historic district and surrounding properties. Lastly, um, all new construction, any increase in building area, customer service area, lot coverage, addition of outdoor storage, customer waiting, or a change of use of any commercial structure within the C5 
must be approved via the special use permit site plan review process. Um, I'll note that this is um, one of the pieces of the proposal that is more stringent than any um, than with any other district in the town, um, and and so there might want to be some discussion on on that section as we move through this. Um, next up, we're going to have section eight point six point six point four. This is just uh, we actually already talked about it, but this is just where we spell out um, that. Uh, if you scroll down just a little bit, um, that within the C5 historic character commercial zoning district, lot coverage shall not exceed 40% of the lot area, and it may be increased to 50 with the use of permeable paving. So we already touched on that, but that's what it looks like in ordinance form. Next up, we're going to have section 10.82. Um, this is pretty straightforward. This is just a section in our code where we were talking about uh, commercial design standards, um, what it didn't apply to and where it did apply. And so we just wanted to make sure that the C5 was added um, to the list of commercial zoning districts. Um, beyond that, we have sections 10.24, section 7.78, 7 7.45, and 7.23. Um, that are essentially just areas within the code as it pertains to um, the height of walls and fences. Um, uh, what else is in there? I think there's a, a section in there related to um, distances. Uh, there's some distance requirements. Um, if there's a consideration of having a sexually oriented business within the town, it has to meet some parameters, and so we needed to include the C5 in that. Um, so there we go. We can scroll down just a little bit there. And then next up um, is we wanted to include the C5 in the definition section for commercial transition protective yard. And um, this is an increased buffer yard where you've got a high intensity use adjacent to a residential district. Or it can even be a commercial district, but a parcel that's been developed residentially. So we just wanted to make sure that um, where that occurred, we had at least noted that that buffer yard did apply to the C5 as well. Um, let's see if I can, if you'll just scroll. <laughs> I'm still not happy with me. Um, the next part of what you'll see um, is not actually amendments that are within our unified development ordinance. It's not a, a within the land use portion of the code, it's just within the general town code. Um, and here again, we just wanted to include the C5 where we needed to. Section 12.13, the licensing of sexually oriented businesses. If you'll scroll down, we just wanted to add C5. Um, to that also where we talk about maximum uh, noise levels permitted by zoning district. We wanted to make sure that the C5 um, was also listed where we talk about um, commercial uses and, and what that decibel level is going to be. I think that wraps up those, the actual um, text amendment piece. So next up, I want to say is where we move in to the actual rezoning or the map amendment. Um, so if you'll scroll down, Karen, I think pretty soon there's going to be a map that pops up. Yes. Um, so this first image on the map, um, that's the area of the proposed map amendment. It's what we've been discussing, Danube to Hollowell, between the highways. It's the existing zoning, which you'll see is C2 entirely. Um, and we've marked uh, some of the commercial businesses to kind of acclimate you to where, where everything is. Um, and if you scroll down just a little bit, this is the um, proposed 
map amendment. So this is what the planning board discussed at their January meeting. Uh, this is what we received the recommendation on, and this is what we have obviously moved forward for the board's consideration today. The C5, which I've been talking a lot about, that's the sort of the light blue area. Um, I don't think, this doesn't show up on TV, so I apologize, but I don't think my cursor is going to bear with me. But this uh, light blue area, that's the proposed C5 district. That's the proposed um, commercial district that we're talking about. Um, this yellow, patches of yellow, that's the R3, the high density residential zoning district. The R3 previously existed within our code. Um, so there were no changes that needed to be made there. In the R3 district, your um, your lot size, your minimum lot size is going to be 15,000 square feet. Your side yard setbacks are going to be um, 8 feet for residential. And your minimum lot area uh, is, you know, your minimum lot area is 15,000. Your minimum lot width is going to be 50. So in addition to just looking at the existing uh, land development patterns and saying, okay, we, you know, we kind of have a grouping of commercial in this area and we have groupings of residential in this area, um, you'll notice there's some vacant properties as well in, in here. And when you look at those properties, they're, they're all about 50 feet in width and they're all about 15,000 square feet. Not all of them, but some of them, the majority of them. So um, it made sense to propose the R3 there because if you were to make, if we were to propose R2, the lot area might become non-conforming because in the R2, the minimum lot area is 20,000 square feet and a minimum lot width of 60. So, um, and then it just goes on up from there. For R1, the lot area is greater, the lot width is greater. Um, so based upon the existing lot size, the existing lot area here, um, that's why we chose to go with the R3. Um, so again, there's a little, there's a, another pocket of commercial um, here. And then if we can move the map over a little bit so we can see further north. It's perfect. Um, here's some additional proposed C5 areas, some commercial areas. And then you'll notice here, uh, this light yellow color, that's going to be the proposed R3 district. And then you'll, you'll see that it goes uh, a little beyond that, even north. And we have this inset map here um, that shows the area on the east side of Memorial. That's Old Nags Head Place subdivision. Um, these properties, uh, this property is currently zoned C2. The properties here that are already developed residentially, those have already been developed to the R3 standards that I just spoke about. Um, this area here of Old Nax Head Place, that's zoned C2, but it's developed residentially and it was developed to the R3 standards. Um, same here as you move further north um, up, to, up to Bainbridge. So that area, um, even though it's been zoned C2, it's all been developed to the R3 standards um, commercially. So that's, uh, that was the recommendation for the proposal here with the R3 zoning district. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of questions about the map. Uh, we can zoom in and out of this, hopefully, uh, for any site-specific questions. Um, but that's, that's where we're at in terms of um, what has been proposed with regard to both the UDO text amendments um, as well as the map amendments. I'll say that um, part of a map amendment, there's some notice requirements, has to be in your local paper, um, two consecutive weeks, it has to be advertised. Um, property owners uh, within the area of the rezoning as well as adjacent property owners um, are to be sent a letter um, to the address that's shown on the Dare County tax records. Um, and, and that was done. And um, I know we were 
talking about um, maybe littering of signs, and I'm sure everybody loved my littered yellow public hearing signs that have been out there for a couple weeks. So um, hopefully uh, people that were interested in this had an opportunity to see those signs, receive their letter, see it in the paper, um, see the, the numerous uh, articles that have been done on it over the course of time. So. Um, I believe that's it for me. It's a lot of information. Um, I'm happy to, to go back if there's specific questions that anyone has. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, are there, and, I'm sorry, Mr. Mary. Are there any questions for Ms. for Ms. Wyatt? Yeah, I think I need to start down here. So, Commissioner okay. Sanders. All right. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of information, um, and I do see a lot of business owners in here. Um, we have a number of how many businesses this might make non-conforming in the uh, C5? Sure. So within the C5 um, zoning designation, there are two uses um, that are not proposed to be allowed within the C5 that are currently within this area, and that is shopping center slash group development. Um, and we do have two of those in this area. Um, one is going to be Jockey's Ridge Crossing. The other is going to be Surfside Plaza. Okay. Um, the other uh, use that is currently within this area but was not proposed to be permitted in the C5 um, is automobile fueling stations. So we have... Um, the 7-Eleven at Conk Street and the Duck Through at um, Deering, I believe. Okay. Um, is the, I think it's Deering. Um, so those, those are the four uses that would, that would create a use nonconformity. Um, I will go ahead and jump in and say that uh, since we drafted this um, to today, even staff has noticed some tweaks and revisions that would be helpful to have. Um, and I'm, I can discuss those later on if, if it's appropriate to do so. But, um, but as is, it, it's those two uses and there's four properties that it would affect. That would be my next question, I guess, as a business owner is, I guess one of the tweaks would be to put some protection in there for it, for these businesses in case, like, one of them burnt to the ground. And It is. Um, and we have, I drafted this up just in a Word document that uh, maybe Karen can pull up for us and scroll down just a little bit. I think it's the very last item. There we go. So uh, section 5.6.1 of the UDO is the section that speaks to um, non-conforming uses. So I'll say that we have non-conforming structures, we have non-conforming sites, we have all degrees of non-conformities. And for a non-conforming structure, so say that your use is fine, uh, but your structure encroaches into a setback or is too high or something like that. We actually have language in there that says um, if your non-conforming structure is destroyed or um, removed for any purpose, that it can be put back um, in, the, in the same footprint with the same degree of non-conformities that it had before it went away. And so as staff were like, we probably need something like that for non-conforming use as well. So um, this is what we've drafted for non-conforming use. Um, the the um, black wording is the existing terminology. You can see where we're striking through some items and adding new items in the red underline. Um, but essentially, if the board were to consider it, it would read, no existing structure devoted to a use not permitted by the UDO in the district in which it's located shall be enlarged or structurally alter altered in a way that increases the degree of nonconformity. 
period. And then a structure, whether it's conforming or not, setbacks, um, occupied by a non-conforming principle <coughs> use, destroyed or otherwise modified by any means, may be repaired, maintained, or replaced with an identical or similar structure and identical use, regardless of value, provided the repair, maintenance, or replacement does not create new structural or use nonconformities or increase the degree of the structural or use nonconformities. So that means um, take those four businesses that I noted. If anything were to happen to those businesses, whether it was destroyed by fire, storm, or whether the property owner just wanted to rebuild it. They could do that to the exact same degree that it existed prior. Um, and of course, there's an opportunity to make it better or architecturally compliant, <laughs> but, um, yeah. but it can be, but it would be able to be rebuilt. So then below that, we wanted to note, the same goes for um, site improvements like parking, landscaping, Stormwater management, uh, stormwater management measures. Those um, located on a property that contains a non-conforming use, um, those site improvements um, can be maintained and they can be expanded to the extent that it meets the current standards. So, um, trying to think about you know parking. If, a, if there's an existing business uh, that's made non-conforming by this amendment um, and they want to add additional parking and they have the lot coverage and the lot area and the setbacks to do it, this would not preclude them from doing it. Thank you. Thanks sure. for all your work too. Um, that's all I have at this time. Mr. Brink. I appreciate you starting with the amendments and starting at the bottom, but I'd be curious if it's okay with the mayor that we can go ahead and see the other amendments that you may be proposing oh, to be yeah. made, if that's okay with Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, and I, I apologize. I, this is kind of a think it through for me and, and what may come up and how we're going to address it. But um, the first bullet point I had there was adoption of the MAP amendments, the C5 and the R3. Is that something you want to consider as presented? Are there revisions that you would like to see? Um, and if so, we'll take note of that. The second bullet point that I had there, um, lot coverage requirements um, for the C5, as I said, it's different than it is in the C2. So in the, uh, in the C2, you're allowed to have 55% lot coverage. And in the proposed C5, it's that 40 plus bumping it up to 50 with permeable materials. Um, and if I will say that is an opportunity for nonconformities right there. Just by the adoption of the C5 as is, that could make a business nonconforming with regard to their lot coverage. And there's some allowances within the code that we could work with, but just to make it um, in alignment with the C2, we could switch it out for the language that's up there now. Um, lot coverage shall not exceed 45% of the lot area and it may be bumped to 55 with the use of permeable paving. So we're still keeping that, incent or that desire to have some permeable materials, but we're allowing it to, to in total be the same, 55 and 55. Um, so C5 district, uh, as staff and I'm sure as planning board, going through that table at section 6.6 .6, um, with so many uses, it, it's hard to capture everything. And I certainly recognize that I missed things. I know at the planning board level, planning board members were, why is this not in there? Why is that not in there? And I was like, oh, well, it should be. I, I missed that, my bad. Um, so there, there could always be other items. One that I noted would be the board, may wish to put shopping centers back in as an allowable use within the C5. Uh, shopping centers are currently a special use permit. Um, would recommend that it stay that way. Same for group development. Um, 
I'll note group development is a group of buildings on a single site occupied and used for offices, retail, personal service, indoor recreation, restaurants. Um, so I feel like group development captures Surfside Plaza, probably more so than shopping center because it's uh, multiple buildings on one property. Uh, Jockey's Ridge Crossing, Kitty Hawk Heights area. Um, it's got the, the large building and, and then the, the other building on there. So uh, it probably falls within group <coughs> development or shopping center. Um, mixed use development. Um, that's a single building um, containing more than one type of land use, and it's a combination of uses, but um, it's always going to have a residential component to it. And then lastly, commercial with accessory residential. And um, I'll acknowledge an error um, with my staff report if you've looked in here. So commercial with accessory residential. Um, when I think about this, I think about Nags Head Cafe. So it's on NC12. Um, so with the new regs, it would be limited to 3,500 square feet of habitable area. You look at the tax card and it's a little bit of, it's, it's almost, um, it's right at 4,000, I believe. But it's got an accessory residential component to it. So that actually takes the restaurant down into conformity with the 3,500. Um, when we acknowledge that there's accessory residential included into it. So um, personally, I, as staff, I acknowledge commercial with accessory residential does need to be added back into that list. Um, and then just others, um, over the course of conversation, if there's other uses that people are interested in, we can add it, lift it in words, so we can, I thought I might be able to do it, but Karen will probably have to help me. Um, and if you'll scroll back up just a little bit, Karen, to the top. So this, that bullet point right there, um, it's a very quick one, um, but it has a, a lot of impact. So like I said, currently, all the uses proposed within the C5 would be considered under the special use permit. So change of use, an addition, a revision to your plan. Um, in any of those items, um, expansion of lot coverage, expansion of customer service, it's all going to be considered be via the special use process. It's about a three month process at best. Um, and so perhaps not all of the uses in the C5 um, should be special use. Perhaps there's certain uses that you think um, could just be permitted uses. It's something that we could handle as a staff administratively. Um, and so what I'd propose there is, is basically just to mim mimic the permitting of the use in the C5 with how it would be in the C2. So if a use would be a special use in the C2, it would also be a special use in the C5. But if a use would be permitted in the C2, it would also be per permitted by right in the C5. Um, scroll down a little bit and and here's what we just talked about so um, there's certainly uh, more items more bullet points that we can add to this if we need to but those were the things that came to mind um, that we may want to have more conversation on today I appreciate the, the amendments that you have proposed. The special use permit is special to me because I don't believe business owners should have to go through that three-month process of jumping through hoops and time, money, and effort. So I appreciate that. Looking at the other amendments, you've also decreased some of the nonconformities by adding some stuff back in. Yes. Which I, I think is, is, is needed to further protect these businesses that are affected. But uh, I do appreciate your time and also uh, providing this with the amendments that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm probably going to have a lot of questions at the end before we, you know, either move to adoption or, or um, direct this back to staff for changes. Um, so I'm only going to ask one question at this point and then one observation. In the um, 
Section 8.3, Special Development Standards. 8.3.22 reads, in addition to achieving compliance with the commercial design standards. And the commercial design standards are pretty well known. Everybody uses them. They were designed to make things look like old nags had. Steep roofs, wraparound porches, dormers, limited window area, et cetera, et cetera. We already have those standards on the books. This says, however, in addition to that, the Board of Commissioners must also make a finding that the proposed building design reflects the heritage of old nags head and does not diminish the unique architectural character of the cottage row. What does that mean? If you were trying to make a recommendation to the board and said this meets the architectural standards, but it also does or does not meet the standard of reflecting the heritage of old nags head, what would you be looking for? Well, um, I understand your question. There is some, um, um, I guess, ambiguity there. The reason this was added, um, and this might not be a, a likable thing for me to say, but um, our commercial design standards are twofold. The, the first portion of that is um, you have an option to acquire 150 architectural design points through our architectural design manual. Um, and if anybody's looked at that or familiar with that, um, as the mayor stated, it, it you know it, it says things like um, if you provide an 812 roof pitch on your structure, that's 25 points, and if you provide cedar shake siding, that's 25 points, and a gable bracket is five points, and a porch is based on the uh, perimeter of the porch and things like that, and um, you can get to that 150. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, this may not be a likable thing to say, but in the time I've been here, we've had structures that met the 150, mm -hmm. but did not have the old Nags Head style. Um, it might have, yes, on paper, had the elements to get the number of points, um, but visually, it, it didn't reflect old Nags Head style. Um, and, and then there's a separate set with the adoption of the UDO of commercial design standards, which is probably a little bit better than just the blanket 150, mm -hmm. um, but there's probably still potential there to meet those and still come out with a product um, that isn't reflective of old Nags Head style. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, noted maybe there's opportunities to um, clarify the language tighten it up change it completely you know whatever's recommended by this board but that was the intent okay. of that language. so potentially we could codify that rather than rather than leave it to to judgment can, I, can, can I note something real quick on that sure so originally all these uses were proposed to be special uses so for the uses that if the board decides to not make all the uses special uses we would need to take that out because that's a finding that would be made for a conditional use permit okay. so obviously if it's not a special use the board can't make findings for the approval okay all right thank you uh, my other observation is you know whether the percentages are 40 percent with 50 percent to if you use permeable paving or 45 and 55 I'd asked a question if, if this change was about drainage, and the answer was that it was about development intensity on the site, attempting to reduce that by going from 55 to 40. If we make it 40 to 50 with permeable paving or 45 to 55, I know what developers are going to do. They're going to go to the maximum and they're going to use the permeable paving to get there. So we haven't changed the intensity on the site. We've just made it more expensive to get to the 50 or the 55%. So that's my observation about that. Mayor Cahoon. Mayor. Mayor. Excuse I mean, me. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I would pray. I would pray. <laughs> Congratulations. Please, you, you can keep your seat, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> There's your chuckle of the day. Um, most of my questions have been asked already. I will have quite a number of comments at the end. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing the public comments as well, um, which would be what I would base some of my comments on. 
right. So I'll reserve my time Thank for the you. end. Thank you. Commissioner Sears. Real quick, Kelly, in, in lieu of the mayor's comments, you mentioned neighborhood scale, and how does that really vary differently than the C2 based on anything other than the lot coverage requirements? Um, so first thing that comes to mind here is in the, in the C2 district, a commercial structure can be 20,000 square feet in area. It's maxed at 20,000 square feet. In the proposed C5, it's going to be maxed at 10,000 square feet for those lots adjacent to um, 158. For, um, and the same goes for properties on NC12. Um, you know, on, on NC12 now, um, there's a limitation of, um, I believe it's 10,000, and this is going to take it to 3,500. So the, the size of your building is going to be different. Um, there could be lot coverage implications that are different between the C5 and the C2 as well. Um, so those, and the uses, to be honest with you, there's the, the proposed set of uses within the C5 um, is, is condensed from those uses that are allowed in the C2. That's all, Mayor. Thank you, okay. Kelly. Thank you. Um, one other observation or question, if I may, before we go to the public comment. Commissioner Sanders asked about the nonconformities. You referenced fueling stations and the two nonconformities. I want to clarify, those are, would be nonconforming uses. They would have two strikes against them. One, they are fueling facilities. Second, they are convenience stores. So if we don't if we leave convenience stores out of the ordinance, even if they did away with their pumps and canopies, they would still be non-conforming uses. Correct. Okay. And maybe we add convenience store to that word document that we just had in there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, if that's it from the commissioners for now, uh, then Mr. Lighty, we will proceed with um, public comment. I will ask, there are a lot of folks here, um, if your comment has essentially been made, and I know many of you have prepared comments, and we're not going to cut anybody's time, but if a comment has been made, if you could simply echo that comment um, and, and observe that, that you, you um, concur with that comment that was made earlier, it may speed the process up a little bit. John. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> so with that, um, this is the opportunity for members of the public to provide comment on these proposed changes. Again, if you'll please start by telling us who you are and where you live, uh, and then address your comments to this matter. I'm Bob Edwards. I live at 107 West Gray Eagle Street here in Nags Head. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, appreciate all the work that you're doing. I know it's been a very difficult job and and it's going to continue to be a very difficult job I'm afraid I want to kick this back to where this this mess all started and that was with the with the proposal on workforce housing uh, the comprehensive plan does not address workforce housing uh, it remains a, a major concern of this property that was designated for the uh, workforce housing has been had been uh, zone C2 since 1969. And a side, of, side note to that, it was offered for sale to the town when I was mayor, and maybe we should have bought it and we wouldn't have this problem that we're talking about this morning. <laughs> but, but we had, uh, we had uh, invested in the Dowdy, Dowdy Park property and didn't feel like it was a matter that the town should invest in property that we weren't going to use right away. Uh, the decision was made because of that to take uh, multifamily dwellings out of the C2 and put it into C1. Now, there's only one problem with C1. There's, there's nothing mapped in Nags Head that is C1. So right now, there is, there is, no, uh, there is no, problem, no place for multifamily housing in Nags Head. I live in a $16 million building that's 12 years old. It's in noncompliance. Uh, I hope it ends up in C1 sooner or later. But that's not this morning's issue. This morning's issue is carrot areas. These are spelled out in the 2015 comprehensive plan. It's a good plan. It was developed while I was mayor. It was approved. 
uh, with a tremendous amount of citizen input to that. Uh, Carriage areas were new to our planning effort at that time, and uh, it might have been that we uh, were might have taken that a little bit too far. I don't know, but it was it was new, and it was something that we thought that Nags had needed if we were going to keep Nags Head the place that we all love to live. <clears throat> the current areas were not designed to have fences built around them, but were designed to, to uh, reflect the character of an area that may have some pluses and minuses and some ins and outs, so they were not defined with a specific area around them, but that was the original intent, and I'm not sure uh, how it's migrated to this, the point that we're talking about this morning. Uh, the historic character area is, uh, has been a problem for quite a while. We, uh, back when I was on the planning board probably 15 years ago, we had, uh, had tried to get that area designated as a National Historic District, and the owners did not want to do that at that time, so that was dropped. Uh, the historic area is very important in Nags Head. That's where we basically started, and that's what we really based all of our uh, building regulations on on that character. In my opinion, the, the present ordinance is too restrictive and that we need to revisit it. Uh, Mr. Sanders asked a while ago about the businesses in that area. There are currently 18 businesses. Seven of them would, are not permitted in the UC5, and 11 would be with special use. So everything there would either be special use or not permitted under, under the new regulations, and, and I'm, I'm not sure that we, uh, we see those businesses too obnoxious to stay in that area. So uh, that's, that's something we really need to look at. It, are we too, too tight on these regulations? Because uh, if you've got that many businesses there already and, and all of them are special use or, or, uh, or not permitted. Another problem I see is R3 along 168. That's, that's a major problem uh, that has to be addressed. I don't think R3 along 168 is an appropriate use, and uh, particularly since it's interspersed, interspersed with the, uh, with the uh, commercial areas. If you look at the maps, we have a little bit of R3 in the commercial area and a little bit of more of R3 in, in the commercial area. Uh, we need to we need to look at that and, and see if we can't make that more uh, more consistent. Basically, what I'm asking this morning, let's slow down and make sure we do this thing right. I want to remind you, a lot of you weren't around at this time, but what happened to Cottage Courts several years ago? There was a problem in South Nags Head, and the board made Cottage Courts non-conforming. And our college courts fell into disrepair. We were almost out of business. And finally, we saw the light and made cottage courts conforming again. And I think that might be what might happen to some of these businesses if, if we continue along the path we are. So I'm asking you, let's slow down. We don't have to approve this ordinance right away. Things are under control. Let's make sure we do it right and do it right the first time. I thank you for your time and efforts and in all that you're doing to keep Nags Head the place that we love and the place that we want to tell you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. John, it was a while since we started this and there was a lot of presentation and comment. Will you reiterate the time limits, please? Yes, sir. If the um, um, if, if everyone would please try to keep their remarks within five minutes, please. Um, since we do have quite a few people here, and if you have anything to, if you don't have anything new to add, just please say you re repeat or reiterate what someone previously had said. Yes, sir. Hey, good morning. My name is Basil Belgians. My wife and I live at 3521 South Memorial Avenue. I didn't expect to see former Mayor Edwards here. I just want to share a quick anecdote. When we bought a house here, we were neighbors with him and Anita. They are Nags Head royalty, mm -hmm. for sure. I'm sorry you didn't get to hear that. <clears throat> Thank you for keeping this public hearing on a scheduled date today. 
I'd also like to thank Kelly White and her staff and the planning board members themselves for the work on this. They put a lot of time and effort into it, so thank you to them. <clears throat> I'd like to provide a couple statistics for you. I've watched or attended every board of commissioners and planning board meeting since the uh, subject of a low income housing project came up at the October 5th board of commissioners meeting. And I've kept track of all the related comments. <clears throat> at the October 19th public hearing, when the 150 day moratorium, excuse me, was approved, one of the speakers in favor of that project said there was not overwhelming opposition in the room that day. This is when emails were still being read and accepted as part of the public comments. That day, there were 12 public comments in favor of the moratorium and eight against it. Another statistic. Started with the October 5th meeting and through the February 21st planning board meeting, there have been 41 public comments either against the affordable housing project or for the moratorium, moratorium or for the proposed rezoning. There have been 16 of the opposing view. So to date, 72% of the public comments were ultimately in favor of the proposed amendments. <clears throat> We have a group of neighbors here today that support the proposed rezoning. Some of them will speak, but not all of them. So at this time, we have a large group of folks that have been communicating. I'd like you to stand up just so we can get a visual. And if you're already standing part of that crowd, please step forward and raise your hand. Okay, thank you, everybody. So in closing, I support the proposed rezoning with this combination of R3 and new zoning C5 for the historic character area understand there are some amendments that may be coming. It will preserve the look, feel, and nature of the area as described in the 2017 Comprehensive Land Use Plan. And I urge the Board of Commissioners to approve the amendments today. This is the third related public hearing in less than 150 days. We've all had plenty of time to review, comment, and or revise the proposal. Thanks for letting me speak. Thank you, sir. Next. Next. Uh, good morning, Mayor, Commissioners. I'm John Harris uh, with Kitty Hawk Kites, one of the oldest continuously run businesses in Nags Head between Danube and Hollowell. Uh, we're starting to celebrate our 50th year in March. Um, first, I want to thank the planning board and staff that have put a lot of time into these amendments, trying to come up with a UDO that will work. Uh, it's a huge, huge challenge, as we've heard in the comments this morning. Um, if we go back to the Nags Head Comprehensive Plan that's been mentioned numerous times this morning, uh, one, of the, one of the lines in that plan is the town is committed to sustaining a thriving local business community that supports residents and visitors. The amendments as written do not support a thriving local business community. Um, and these are my counts from the tables that were sent out, but, and this varies from the counts that were given this morning. But out of 22 businesses between Danube and Hollowell, and I believe there are more than 22 between Danube and Hollowell, but it makes nine of the businesses not permitted and the remaining 13 businesses permitted only by special use permit. A special use permit is an additional level of oversight and governance that businesses outside the district will not have to deal with, so it creates an unfair playing field. If we are trying to support local businesses as Nags Head Comprehensive Plan states, why don't we write amendment, amendments supporting those businesses uh, that make them permitted and conforming and not making them jump through more hoops? I ask you to vote against the proposed UDO and zoning map amendments pertaining to the historic character area and the moratorium adopted on October 19, 2022. Um, these are my reasons. There is no protection of small businesses in the amendments. Now we heard about an amendment just now, which I had not seen, but that amendment has not been passed, so currently there is no protection for the existing businesses between Danube and Hollowell. Many are made non-conforming by the amendments so that they, if they have more than 50% storm or fire damage, they could not be rebuilt. 
So in order to consider amendments in to the UDO as proposed, we need to start with an ironclad guarantee that existing businesses can be rebuilt as is with no strings attached. Uh, number two, uh, second issue is making commercial property between Danube and Hollowell less valuable than commercial property in the rest of the town. And one of the things that does that is uh, the proposed new lot coverage. Um, so reducing lot coverage from 55%, which it currently is, to 40% in the new C5 district. Why would an investor invest in the above district? Most investors would purchase commercial property that they could get more building on and more parking on uh, so that they can get a return on their investment. This will make the commercial property between Danube and Hollowell worth less than the rest of the town and is in effect down zoning the property. Uh, lot coverage should be the same throughout the town of Nags Head. Uh, number three, uh, conditional use permit. Businesses between Danube and Hollowell will be required to operate under conditional use permits as we heard about this morning whereas other businesses in the town will not have that requirement. That will put those businesses at a disadvantage in comparison to other businesses in the town of Nags Head. Um, again, the rules should be the same for the entire town. And uh, number four, which I didn't address in my letter, but the overlay of square footage is another issue uh, with these amendments. Why not start with the existing square footages of the historic businesses and build the ordinances, the amendments around those businesses so that they're conforming and then go from there. Uh, there shouldn't be any change to setbacks from the existing ordinances that again create a hardship on businesses between Danube and Hollowell. Um, and as, as I saw on the maps this morning, uh, if, you know, if, if R3 is being extended to the north of Hollowell, uh, as shown on the map amendment this morning, uh, why shouldn't C5 be extended north to match this, the uh, amended C3 district? There are a number of old businesses in that area uh, and why shouldn't they fall under the same uh, guidelines or amendments? Mr. Harris, that's uh, five minutes. Okay. Thank you all very much. I know everybody's trying really hard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Good morning. I'm Sandra Allen. I reside in Southern Shores now on Deer Path Lane. I am a former resident of Nags Head. I'm married to John Harris, full disclosure. Uh, I'm a CFO at Kitty Hawk Kites, which as John said, um, and as I'll say now, uh, not many people who work at Kitty Hawk Kites have heard me say this often, but I agree with what John has just said. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, I promise I'm not going to repeat it all you and maybe uh, you won't have to cut me off this time but uh, we have heard some changes today in terms of what we were came here prepared to speak about now seems to be changing at the last minute so uh, it's a little hard to know um, which we are addressing what we have just been reading in the last few days since we were notified um, of what was happening or what we've just heard about. So I guess to jump to the end, I'd like to say that what I really want to ask is that you vote against the proposal that's on the table today. Uh, I wouldn't ask you to vote on something that's a little bit tweaked in the last minute, um, but I understand there are some problems that need to be addressed and I would hope that you would just send some direction back to the staff and the planning board to try to solve the problems at hand uh, without trying to create 
other issues for businesses in the town that I don't think were problems that needed to be fixed. Um, it seems like the issue of workforce housing is, I recognize, a huge issue with strong feelings and uh, something people in many parts of not just our community are struggling with to solve. It's a big, big problem, but I don't understand why trying to solve that issue has reached out to change um, long-standing businesses like Kitty Hawk Heights, where I work. Um, and I'd like to also mention the other smaller businesses at Jockey's Ridge Crossing, um, which are not included <laughs> on that list. So there are more businesses than we've seen mentioned. Um, there's more non-conformities than we've talked about. We focused, I think, on, on use and not uh, structure when answering the question about non-conformities. But uh, at Jockey's Ridge Crossing, we have a business uh, as old as the fudgery from around 1987 when the connection was built. A long-standing tradition like Kitty Hawk Heights. And then we have a new business, Abby's Teas, you heard mentioned earlier. That's a young lady who grew up on the Outer Banks, um, came back to work here a while, moved away, and then returned with her husband and opened Abby's Teas and Sudden Light Records. A very, very small community business that with what's on the table today, if Jockey's Ridge Crossing were to, to burn or have some other catastrophe and be unable to rebuild, uh, those small businesses that are at Jockey's Ridge Crossing would also be displaced. Um, so I just hope that you will vote against the proposal on the table today and try to solve the problems at hand without um, downzoning the business of Nags Head. When I read your very well thought out comprehensive plan, I see a whole different message about being flexible and maintaining the businesses on the beach road of uh, Nags Head. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Good morning. Whoops. Uh, I'm J.W. Jackson. I uh, have residence at 3543 South Virginia Dare. Um, much appreciate the character of Nags Head. My family's owned property both sides at Nags Head from 1939, and I grew up spending my summers here. Uh, when, uh, and I have accommodation when we built our house in 2004, I got a commendation from the city on uh, striving to maintain the character of uh, the housing here. Um, living on the uh, Hollowell Beach access, I, I see, you know, I'm very familiar with that area, obviously, but I, what I didn't understand was why we're going for high density housing in an area on either side of Hollowell uh, that's currently this pretty much the standard uh, Nags Head property. And I'm particularly concerned with that undeveloped area. If that goes, and I don't know what high density housing is because I've lived in Atlanta and other big cities, and I know what high density usually means. Uh, so, we're already very much overutilized at our access. Hollowell is a small access, but it's got a lifeguard. It's well placed for the houses around it. Um, the people who are across the street from us, you know, back in your area, everybody utilizes that thing and the city has expanded that parking onto Hollowell, but it's still, during the summer, it's just huge. And so the crossing, of 12 and of Croatan, if you, if you allow high density, you're gonna get a lot more pedestrian traffic and a lot more traffic to more exacerbate the problem at the uh, beach access, as well as crossing 
Croatan to get to uh, the Jackie Ridge Park. Uh, so I don't, I didn't understand why that area on both sides of Hollowell were kind of designated as high density. So I would ask you to reconsider that and maintain the character of the existing properties. Um, I guess there's about 15 lots in there that could be developed. Uh, on the north side of Hollowell, I thought the developer did a pretty good job of developing that adjacent to uh, Croatan, and I haven't heard any complaints from the folks who have that property. So uh, that, that's my main concern. I didn't, just didn't understand why that property was designated in that way. And I'd ask you to reconsider that and maintain um, kind of the, the character of that, of that area. So that's all I've got to say. I appreciate the time. Mr. Lighty, I'm going to do something we don't usually do, which is introduce comment in the middle of the public comment, um, because this issue has come up, and I don't want anybody else here laboring under the same misunderstanding. Our R3 is labeled high density, unfortunately. Our R3 zoning is single family on a slightly smaller lot than R2. That's all it is. It's single family development on a slightly smaller lot, and it is not, it is the highest density of single family development in the town of Nags Head, but it's not high density uh, development, just to clarify. So, okay, you just scared the heck out of me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, thank you, John. <laughs> thank continue. you, Mr. Mayor. All right, who, who would like to uh, comment next? Hi, my name is Shelley Blackstone, and I have a property in Nags Head, and um, I'm in the Basil camp. <laughs> but um, uh, I don't think anybody, I mean, I think everybody loves the local businesses that are here. Um, we, I think we all enjoy them. I think that what it is is that a future 20,000 square foot building in pl places that are now zoned for that, we, we don't need any more of that. And I think that's really... Um, can't, you know, I, I think that's the gen general uh, feeling um, that we, we don't want to overdevelop. We don't need more 20,000 square foot buildings in the area. Things. Thank you, Ms. Blackstone. <laughs> Thank you. Good, good morning, Commissioners. Um, my name is Jeff Pavlak. My wife and I, Pat, uh, we've owned the house on, at 3616 South Virginia Air Trail since um, 2012. We have been coming down here. We're really newbies compared to a lot of the folks in this room, but we've been coming down here since 1998 with our family. Uh, we stayed in Kill Devil Hills, but we really fell in love with Nags Head and the charm that was here. Uh, and when it was time for us to buy, we looked at Kitty Hawk, looked at Kill Devil Hills, but we, but we chose to buy here. Um, we, I do want to also thank you, before I go any farther, I want to thank all the commissioners and also the planning board for all their hard work and effort and professionalism in what they did with this whole project. It's very complex, very complicated. And it's kind of morphed from where it originally started back in September, October to here. And again, it, it is impacting a lot of folks, business owners and all. My wife just mentioned to me, she says, make sure we say, we also very much appreciate the businesses that are here. We love it. We love the feel and the culture and, and, and the overall view of the, of the town. So that's not the part, but it's again, not having to look to see more buildings that are going to get bigger. As we, as we were coming down yesterday for this meeting, we immediately go to Beach Road as soon as we can get there and just drive on down and feel. And this time I was like looking as I was driving through Kitty Hawk and then Kill Devil Hills and seeing the mega mansions and all these big high-rise motels and everything. And then we hit the Nags Head uh, city limits and it all kind of like, it just calmed down. It took us back to why we fell in love with this place in the first place and why we want to you know, continue. And that's why we are, um, we are, we are, we like the proposal and we are supporting the proposal of taking the C5 to the C2 to the C5 and the R3. Um, we've had many family gatherings here at our house, and with many sunsets, we get to watch out of our back deck, looking at the sunset over Jockey's Ridge, um, and we hope this will continue for many years to come. 
again, want to thank you so much for all your efforts and everything. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Havilar. Good morning. My name is Donna Creep, and I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Outer Banks Association of Realtors, whose mission is to advocate for our membership and for real property rights. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning regarding this proposed rezoning from Hollowell Street to Danube Street, as noted by the other speakers and by the staff. This area has been zoned C2 commercial for numerous years. Rezoning properties from a commercial classification to a residential classification impacts the real property rights of the owners of vacant land in this historic district. The proposed down zoning from commercial to residential could negatively affect the values of these vacant properties. Additionally, the proposed new C5 district renders several businesses in the area's non-conforming uses, as has been mentioned um, by the staff as well as uh, several other speakers. Should these businesses be damaged or destroyed, they could not be rebuilt except in conformity with the new C5 district. Some of these businesses have been here for decades and some have just been built in the past couple of years. Regardless of their tenures, they all have made significant investments in the town, <coughs> and the status of non-conforming use impacts their financial viability and their sustainability. There's a big difference between being a non-conforming use and a non-conforming structure. Well, the staff memorandums that have been posted on the webpage and the FAQs indicate that the rezoning is designed to eliminate is not is designed to not eliminate uses that are already here but to influence future development if that is the goal then revisions to the proposal to grant these existing businesses specific rights to rebuild should be um, factored into the revisions again thank you for the comments and I, I had obviously written these before Kelly got up here and you guys discussed these amendments but those are certainly amendments that should be considered thank you so much thank you Ms. Grief Hi, my name is Vanessa Foreman, and I'm here to read a letter from my son, Philip Foreman, who would have been here himself, but if he had had ample time for this meeting. Um, dear Mayor Cahoon and Commissioners, I hope you are well and enjoying the rest of the relaxation before we get rolling again in what I hope to be another great year for the Outer Banks. I'm writing to express my strong opposition to the proposed amendments to the zoning ordinance that is being considered at your March 1 meeting. The amendments are unfair by signing out, signaling out certain properties and businesses. Nags Head has always been a town that welcomes diversity, looks out for everyone, and treats each other the way that we all want to be treated. The proposed amendments downgrade only selected businesses and properties but leaves most unaffected. I know there are at least three of you that will be voting on the proposed changes who own businesses and commercial property in the town. It would be hypocritical and disturbing that any of you would be willing to cause financial hardship to a select group of fel your fellow businesses and property owners without putting the same restrictions on your own businesses and properties. Sorry. By adopting the proposed amendments, the town of Nags Head will be illegally taking through spot zoning and setting itself up for lawsuits by affected parties. The North Carolina Supreme Court has set precedent that spot zoning businesses and properties is illegal. Not only is the proposed rezoning unfair by singling out a small select area, it is also unjust. What bothers me the most is the way in which we found out and our properties were possibly being rezoned. This is a major issue that affects so many livelihoods, and all we received was notice in regular mail. I did not receive my letter until the 25th for a hearing that is on March 1st. That's only three business days and is completely unacceptable. For every property owner at a minimum should have received a 90-day notice by a certified mail with delivery confirmation. We would have been given the opportunity to understand exactly why Nags Head is trying to rush the rezoning through, why Nags Head is singling out our businesses and properties and given time to hire legal representations to protect our interests. I hope that the town will choose not to move forward with the proposed rezoning at all, but at least I urge you to postpone the hearing for 90 or more days 
so that we have time to prepare and to be present at the hearing. The town has been thriving for years and businesses, the property values have been booming. It makes zero sense to create new zoning when the existing zoning has been working perfectly. More than, more people have been spending time and money in Nags Head than ever. So there should be no reason to change things now. My birth through locations in the affected area is the, my highest grossing store out of five Outer Banks locations and has been serving Nags Head locals and visitors for over 30 years. I and other businesses in the town just cannot get our heads around the sudden condemnation of businesses and properties that are constantly giving back and have been such a big part of our community for decades. Unfortunately, this looks like the town is listening to a handful of very loud millionaire second homeowners along the historic <laughs> Cottage Row versus considering the livelihoods and welfare and targeted businesses and property owners and their hundreds of employees. Many of the Cottage Row homeowners don't even live full time or vote in Nags Head, and many of them happily purchase their homes well after the targeted businesses were in existence under even less strict zoning ordinances. These homes are mostly occupied <coughs> by tourists who are running them for a week at a time, and we all know that our tourists do not care about zoning changes. In fact, most rental guests and even many of the homeowners frequent the very businesses that would be downgraded. The proposed rezoning appears to put more of the town's concerns on a handful of cottage row owners that visit occasionally versus the concerns and livelihood <coughs> of the local property and businesses and business owners and employees that actually work in and contribute to the town's well-being day in and day out. I thank you for your time and for your service to our community. I hope that you will take a moment and put yourselves in the shoes of us who have been putting our blood, sweat, and tears into our businesses for multiple generations in many cases. We have been trying to do our best for our families, employees, customers, and community. I know and respect each of you and feel in my heart that you will consider the above and put yourselves in our shoes that you will do the right thing and not move forward with unfair proposed rezoning amendments. And Nags Head, all businesses and property owners should be treated equally. Thank you for your consideration. Very kind regards, Philip Foreman, President Ruthrew. Thank you, Ms. Foreman. Sorry. <clears throat> Good morning, Mayor Cahoon and Commissioners. My name is Susan Callan, and my husband is Charles Callan. We reside at 104 East Hollowell Street, which is directly across from the 4.7 acre parcel, which proposed development has captured much attention since last October. And if you will direct, look to the left, that is a drone view of the area that we are talking about. The arrow represents 104 East Hollowell Street. To the right of that is the parcel uh, that originally captured all the attention. We do support the town's proposed rezoning classification, which would affect this site, as well as many of the surrounding properties. As for our community's historic character area and the neighborhood's character area, we believe that character preservation has a way of identifying us, connecting us, shaping us, and telling the story of who we are. Character preservation holds an attraction of our history and a sense of community pride. We made a choice to be a part of Nags Head, and with respect, we put our support in you, our local town government, to advocate in the best interest of Nags Head and its people, past, present, and future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kellen. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Clara Smiley. I like to do this, and then everybody can remember the Smiley. <laughs> Forget the Clara. Um, I'd like to thank all of you, especially Andy and Kelly, for all the work that has gone into this. Um, the moratorium has been a useful tool, I think. It has given all sides a time to be heard, and it's given time for a well-thought-out solution to be reached. 
I can't imagine the effort that has gone into this process, but I trust the result will be worth it. On January 4th, I spoke to you. Um, I can't match the th being here since 39, but um, we've been coming to the Outer Banks for over 70 years, and so we've seen lots of changes. And we've been homeowners at 3621 South Virginia Dare Trail for over 50 years. We take great pride in this historical character neighborhood, and I know many of you do as well. We support the new zoning proposals. Um, it will preserve the nature of our neighborhood as laid out in the comprehensive land use plan and will maintain what we have enjoyed through four generations. Thank you again, and we all greatly appreciate all the work that's been done. Thank you, Ms. Smiley. Good morning, commissioners, Mr. Mayor, attendees. Everybody is here in good faith trying to work out a solution. Could you give your us your name? name, sir? I'm sorry. Elliot Catherman. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I own the property that is the elephant in the room. <laughs> I've been coming to the Outer Banks since I was 10 years old. I have a home in South Nags Head. Back in 2000, that piece of property came up for sale and I invested in it, a big investment, because I believe in the value of land here. And so for 23 years, I've been paying commercial rate taxes on that property watching as everything got developed between the highways and decided when I retired in 2020 that it was time to sell. So I hired Bobby Harrell to find an appropriate buyer, which he did. Now, along comes affordable housing contract. People get upset about that. They differ. I understand that. Reasonable minds can differ on that stuff. So the contract fell through when the moratorium was imposed. And I spoke to Commissioner Cahoon and said, What's the future here? She said, we're looking at the appropriate commercial uses between the highways to stay in character. Okay, so I wait and I'm expecting to be included in this new C5. And instead, all of a sudden, I'm in downgraded to <coughs> this R3. This property has been commercial for decades and decades. All the residential property to the north in Old Nags Head Place on the beach road to the east have all bought and built with the commercial property in existence. Indeed, the houses on the beach road, the 17 that line the beach road, bought commercial, built residential on commercial. <clears throat> I think that this is not just to me, to my property, this isn't just rezoning, this is essentially eminent domain taking, gutting, eviscerating the value of my property, taking it from the highest possible use to the lowest, and without any compensation for that. I'm asking, respectfully, that when government officials are going to make decisions that are adversely affecting the property rights of taxpayer citizens, it should only be done for compelling reasons, not notions or subjective preferences. The reasons that I've heard for the proposed rezoning to R3, number one, adjacent residential properties. Well, those properties came along much later than the commercial. And indeed, the ones on the highway built on commercial property itself. Hollowell Street clearly is a line of demarcation between the commercial to the south and residential to the north. The historic Cottage Row, those are beautiful homes. We all appreciate them. I love looking at them every time I drive down the beach road but they start a quarter mile south of my property. There's none in line of sight either direction, and the new 17 houses that were built on the beach road completely obscure any view from the commercial property in that direction. The impact of the Jockey's Ridge Park across the street. My property is 4.6 acres, one of the last remaining large parcels between the highways in Nags Head. And I put this to you. The purpose of all of this is the promotion of the historic character of the area. What is putting 10 
new cookie cutter rental machines with postage stamps sized swimming pools with fences around them along the highway, how is that enhancing the historic character of that area? As opposed to employing the new C5 designations that you're working on to create a, a nestled little village area, if you will, of the retail shops, the ice cream parlor, the coffee shop, all those things that were pointed out as permitted future uses in C5. That's a much better use of that land than 10 more houses. And as importantly, there's no compelling reason to exclude me from C5. There is, however, excellent reasons to include me. It's the best use of the land for the town and for the neighborhood. I mean, people that live in this area are gonna be the ones to use these, these retail shops, cafes, walk-ups, and so on. And it's a fair balance for me as a 23-year owner of that property. That, so I, that's five minutes, Mr. Kefferman. All right, I thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Hello, good morning. My name is Rick Arthur and my wife and I, Barbara, we uh, built a house in Old Nags Head Place in 2009 and uh, be good to know that I only have two quick comments. Uh, one is we highly support the rezoning on the east side of uh, South Memorial Avenue where we live to R3, which is consistent with the rest of the neighborhood. It's already residential, but it will make it consistent, so we do support that. And also we are highly supportive of the rec recommendations by the planning board and uh, the planning staff to rezone uh, according to their plan. Uh, everything south of uh, Hollowell in the historic character area to protect uh, integrity and character of that area. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arthur. How you doing, Frank Campanelli, 3539 South Memorial. Been coming to Nags Head a lot less maybe than some of you for about 40 years. Been a homeowner for about 10. Uh, previously <coughs> mentioned I uh, look to retire here later this year. Um, we're very appreciative of the comprehensive work that, in my judgment, started in 2017. Most recently, you've been really revisiting this and trying to refine it over the past six months. We're very sensitive to the business needs. Um, and when I say sensitive, the reason we came here was the small town, historic format of the community. And the only thing that maybe people should consider, I freak, all I do is come down here, use the restaurants and services. When I live here, that might change. But without people coming down here, you might not have those businesses and services. And I don't know if that gets realized sometimes because I come here from New Jersey. Don't hold that against me, please. <laughs> I'm looking to come down here. But quite frankly, if it didn't have the climate here, I could go to the Jersey beaches for the same money and the same thing. But I chose to come down here because of the small community feel. And I think you should be careful. I think the intent was to preserve the existing businesses, not to handcuff them or handicap them. And I think a lot of effort was done to accommodate that and maybe there's a misunderstanding, and maybe with further refinement you get there. So thank you, appreciate the time, and I wish everybody the best. It's a hard time. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Kevinelli. Oh, Mayor, Commissioners, my name's Chess Harris. Um, I live at 3541 South Memorial, which is um, almost right at the intersection with Hollowell. Uh, it's our home and um, very proudly from the, the guys from the Blue Moon and everyone else, your services and uh, restaurants as well as all the stuff at Jockey's Ridge. I've got more kites floating around the house now than I can <laughs> shake a stick at. But uh, we really appreciate the services. Um, I'm, uh, I fully support the um, amendments that are, that are the proffers that we have here on the amendments to the zoning board. But more importantly, I think there's some sincere consideration must go with some of these amendments which are proposed, especially with the small business piece, and that's clearly <laughs> got to be sorted out afterwards. But the issue dealing with the old Nags Head uh, place, I think, is a no-brainer. Um, the R3 area that's to the west, the exact same type of structures with the same conformity, which are on the east side of, of uh, South Memorial, uh, this is a no-brainer why this ought to, this, it is already a homogeneous area that is clearly fully developed 
and uh, that ought to flow into being voted as an amendment to R3. This is a no-brainer. And I think that the whole issue of the, the vacant lot at the end of Hollowell as it flows into R1, uh, I, I appreciate the issues associated with the many years it sat there. But uh, in the end, it's people that have to come here with places to stay, and then they go for services. I mean, there's, there's a balance between those two. And the move to residential has a, given the change of the Hollowell Street to all being R3, and then just over on RC12, it runs into R1. I think this is a very smooth flowing framework that allows uh, a, a, a character that's easily absorbed. One of the residents spoke earlier about driving down 12 on how as soon as you popped into the Nags Head area, there's a change. It's the houses. It, there's, a, there's a value that just jumps out at you as you make your way down the street. And I think that flow would just be further enforced by that lot uh, being concluded at, as part of the R3, where it very clearly then would flow with the residential capabilities, single phone, single hand, single family residence as planned under R3. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Harris. <coughs> Howdy, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name's Beeman Hines, and I own Sue's Barbecue and the Crazy Cabinets uh, leases for me. Both these properties are right in the middle of this stuff. And I've had them both for over 20 years, grew up here. I just want to make sure that before this stuff goes forward that we really look into a little bit deeper because Bob brought up a bunch of questions already as a business owner here in Ag said it, and you know, I've, I've been a business owner this whole time, Renee, Ben. It, it's, it's a matter of, I found out about this when John Harris called me on Saturday. And uh, the mail was sent out just like they said when it was supposed to, but I was out of town and not around at the time and didn't get it until Monday. So I've only had a few days to even look at this. With everything else I've got going on, I really don't have the time to really look at this like I want to. I've talked to, you know, Ben and Kevin, I don't mind saying that, and both have been very helpful in trying to understand what this is as quick as I can figure it out. It's not something that I can dive into and in a day and a half have it figured out where I feel comfortable saying let's go ahead and approve it, not approve it, or move forward with it. I think there's enough questions out there right now that we've got to hold off on this and let's take some time and, and go back over it some more, even though it's been 180 days or 150 days, whatever it was before, I wasn't even really paying attention to it. I reckon I should have been. Um, but I really feel like everybody here just needs to let, let, let these guys go through what they need to go through, let the planning bo uh, board get back on it, or the planning staff, and there's some things that need to be tweaked. There's some things that are really good out there that I can see that I really like, but there's some things that, you know, making my property value go down is one of them. Not being able to build back is what I was thinking was going to happen. I was told differently on that yesterday. Um, but I just need to get into it a little bit more, and I hope that everybody understands. We're, I'm not trying to hold anything back from what's right for the town of Nags Head and the citizens and the businesses. I just want to look in this thing, delve in this a little bit more and understand there's a lot of us that got a lot of, you know, a lot of money put in this and a lot of time, <clears throat> and it's just, it's aggravating to me not having this where 30 days before and 60 days or 90 days before, or even certified mail like, like Kyle Phillips said. I mean, I, realistically, I think on something this big, I don't need to get it just in the mail. It needs to be sent to me so I know I've got it. Y'all know that we've received it as property owners. Uh, business owners and you know taking care of 25 employees at, at one of the businesses and I don't know what they've got at the other one but I mean it's it's people's lives at stake too as far as business you know being able to work and stuff um, all of us are looking for help uh, that are business owners I can tell you that but uh, if, if something happened to that I, you know not being able to re rebuild like I wanted to re rebuild it is, is kind of uh, aggravating but I appreciate y'all's time appreciate what y'all are doing uh, I know it's tough, but uh, I just I would say just let's hold up a little bit and take our time with it and a little bit more time with it. I know y'all been dealing with it for a while, but just uh, think, think and consider all sides, both sides of this, and I appreciate it. Thank y'all. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. 
My name is Eddie Goodrich and I'm a property owner in the town of Max Head. After listening to everything today, um, uh, the changes that were recommended that Kelly came up with, the biggest thing that was concerning everyone, it appears, was the nonconformities and the inability of property owners of residential, pardon me, of commercial structures that have been so very important to Max Head not being able to be <coughs> rebuilt if they were lost, it appears that you'll get, you'll, you'll address that. And I think that's one thing everybody was really uh, more concerned about than anything else. Um, I also think that uh, uh, what Mr. Catherman said, that his property being zoned C5 commercial is a, a better use of that property than single family or multifamily because of its proximity to the state park. And I think looking, that's very important. So the only thing I can say is that uh, probably the most um, practical thing now is send it back to planning and I think everybody's heard everything they want to hear now. I hope so anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodrich. Hello, my name's Linda Madison. My husband and I have uh, owned property here since 1999. We, li uh, we live in South Nags Head. And um, I've seen a lot of changes since we've been coming here all these years. And now we live here the last five years. And um, the sad thing I saw was old, beautiful, uh, like the Carolinian Hotel. Just anyhow, what I wanted to say was I think it's important that I was surprised to read in the paper that the um, historic Cottage Row homes do not seem to me to be protected in any way for the future to be uh, That was the way I interpreted it. It was the reason I came here today. I don't understand about the other, but I just think those homes, we don't have a whole lot left of that period, and I think that it's, they're very worth uh, protecting. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners and all support staff. Uh, my name is Mike Mishu, <clears throat> excuse me, and I reside at 3427 South Memorial Avenue with my wife, Donna. Um, we have owned property there since 2020 when I came across the bridge literally the day it was opened to make a bid on the house uh, during that pandemic year. Um, we are now full-time residents here in Nags Head. Uh, Don and I have been coming down to uh, Nags Head and bringing our family uh, for over 15 years, always with an emphasis around Jockey's Ridge Park for its beauty, historic heritage, and everything that continues to impress us in the area. <clears throat> As of September of 22, uh, I'm semi-retired after serving over 26 years in a small city of 45,000 in Northern Virginia, which also has a designated uh, historic area and which is being prepared for their 150th anniversary as an incorporated town. I say this as I fully understand the impacts and significant tasks set forth before you and the assistance of the planning board as well as town manager Garman and planning director Miss Wyatt and all the support staff that's gone into this. My wife Donna and I are in favor of rezoning the area subject to the moratorium to the combination of R3 and the newly proposed C5 district. We are in favor of the rezoning proposal as it is very clear to me that through the strategic planning meetings with local government that, that extensive work has gone into the camp comprehensive <clears throat> land use plan and subsequently solidifying the historic character area of Nags Head over the past several years. <clears throat> we believe that the spirit of the comprehensive land use plan should be followed and that this is the proper furtherization of this plan and that the integrity should continue. The historic character area is simply not looking at historic Cottage Row or even Cottage Row looking west towards Jockey's Ridge. Jockey's Ridge was literally here before this country was formed and even before the early explorers came. It is now a state and national treasure which happens to be in our wonderful small town. So it is all up to us to preserve the historical character that we've inherited. This is also about looking from the top of Jockey's Ridge to the east over Cottage Row and everything in between. 
And I ask you, what would you like to see looking eastward on decisions that are being made? It is literally the town seal. It is on the flag. It is what NAGS head stands for. And I hope and realize that looking back at, at this, um, we can continue to be proud to celebrate this historic character area over the next several generations to come. Thank you all for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mishu. Good morning. My name is Charles Callan, and my wife Susan and I live at 104 East Hollowell Street, which is right across the street. Um, I thank the Board of Commissioners and the Planning Board for the time spent in reviewing the zoning map and the comprehensive land use plan. I can tell you that we could have invested our monies in places other than Nags Head for future retirement. But what attracted us to the Nags Head area was the neighborhood of old Nags Head Place. It was the most attractive quality of life. We want to be part and be able to settle in a serene neighborhood tested between the, the, uh, the roadways. We should be grateful that we had an opportunity through individuals such as Carl Lista Fletcher Baum and Ed Green for their legacy and desirable environment that could attract future generations to visit and even settle in the Outer Banks area. We value the quality of life that Nags Head and the Outer Banks has to offer. Though we may be looked at differently as some of the homeowners because we rent. And we do, we rent three months during the year. And that's it. And uh, we are nevertheless homeowners and a property that we invested in uh, and chose to cast our anchor, so to speak, and we have every right to make our voices heard. One of the attractions that brought us to this community is the local arts group. Uh, my entire life has been in the arts in New York City. And we, we came here because we have, we found a vibrancy here in the performing and visual arts and we want to be part of it. We are in support of the proposed rezoning. However, let us not alter the historic character area, uh, character area nor make changes that could have a significant impact on the long-term character of the district and surrounding natural environment. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kellen. Is there anybody else who wishes to provide comment? Me too. Yes, Mr. Harold. Good morning, my name is Bobby Harrell. I uh, operate a real estate company here in Nags Head at 15 and a half mile post. I think most of you that know me know I do appreciate the character and historical significance of Nags Head. 
When we built our office 22 years ago, we built it in keeping with that and actually received an award from the town of Nags Head for that. So we do appreciate that. But I would have to say, too, that uh, I firmly believe in private property rights. I grew up here in eastern North Carolina, been coming to Nags Head since 1950. First invested in Nags Head in 1985 and have continued to do so. Uh, one thing I would say is uh, the broker representing Mr. Catherman, he spoke earlier, and uh, based on what the former mayor said, if, if, if we'd like to get into discussions again about the town buying this property, we'd be glad to meet with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Elliot would echo that, so anyway. Uh, you know, one thing about the C2 zoning, and I think most of you on the board are business people, and a lot of business people here this morning, we're all struggling with housing and employees, because without the housing, you know, we just don't, you know, we're not able to attract employees. You know, the hospital, one of our major employees and needs in the area, uh, you know, they're struggling constantly to keep people here, draw people here, because they can't find housing. And a lot of the issues that we're talking about today came up because of Catherman Track, I'll call it. Um, and there were some misconceptions about that. You know, it, it came out as low income housing. That was not the case at all. This was affordable and essential. I think essential probably identifies it best. Uh, the need for housing for local employees. The hospital alone had a need for 40 people that would fit within the criteria of what Woda Cooper was trying to do on this site. There were only 54 units. So, you know, you're talking about probably half of them could have been used by the hospital. I think anyone that operates a business in this area would have someone that would qualify. <clears throat> as far as the, I would have to call it down zoning to R3, when Paul Schaefer developed Old Nags Head Place, and I would commend any of you that lived there because it's a beautiful neighborhood, well done. But when Paul Shaver bought the property and developed that, there was a reason he didn't develop this in a single family. It just does not meet the needs of single family. You've got a thousand feet of frontage on the bypass. And there's several real estate brokers in here as well. And I think you would agree with me, the hardest sell for any residential property on the whole Ida Bank is trying to sell residential on the bypass. People don't want to live backing up to the bypass. As far as investing in this, you know, Elliot said he bought it 22, 23 years ago. Uh, I looked yesterday, his current tax bill is $14,000 a year. I think most of us can do math in our head if you've owned it for 20 years, what you've invested in taxes alone, and you get to the point that you want to use this property as you retire and not be able to do it. The other thing I would like to address too is that uh, some of these surrounding properties, while I realize they're homes, every property that joins this on either side, even the two older properties on the beach road, were built after it was zoned C2, every property. And many, if not most of these properties, are not just summer homes, they're investment properties. Uh, one property on Hollowell Street that sold last week, uh, on the 24th, it uh, rented for 23 weeks last year. That's an investment property. <coughs> there were a pool of sales for the past year in some of the housing surrounding this. Uh, rental weeks varied from 16 to 36. Average rental week was 23. H homes are built with amenities, pools. You know, they're investment properties for people that they were using the shoulder season. I do the same thing with a home in Ocracoke. But uh, to say that it's strictly residential use is really not. Um, I would ask you to postpone the vote. I think Kelly and her staff have done a great job of trying to pull this together and get some consensus. But it's hard to get you uh, armed around what's happening here and the long-term effect. The C2 zoning was done in 1969. What we're talking about doing today it's going to carry away in the future. Let's give it some more time, some more study. As it's been stated, a lot of the people that this impacts are out of town. They're taking that last vacation or doing other things before the season starts. So I, I ask you to give it more time, more study. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. <coughs> You 
He's with Bill. I don't know. Yeah. It is still morning. Good morning, Mayor, Good Commissioners. Morning. My name is Randy Royal. Uh, I own a property at 3420 South Memorial Avenue. Um, I do rent it, but it's not an investment property. It helps me pay the mortgage on the house to purchase a beach home. So I, I kind of disagree with that matter. We are somewhat, I mean, we're part of the community here, even though we don't live here full time. Also respectfully disagree on the workforce housing. I do agree it's necessary. And, and let me back up. I'm a civil engineer. I, I've been doing this for 43 years, been doing land development. I'm a bit torn here with some of my statements, and we'll get to that in a minute. But workforce housing, you absolutely need it here. We need it everywhere for teachers, policemen, firemen, hospital workers. My understanding of the Woda Cooper was that it was 40% of the median income, which was about $29,000 a year. Most teachers made too much money to qualify for that housing. Huge problem with that going in there. That's gone away though, is my understanding from talking to Kelly for the text amendment that you cannot do that in C2. I think C2 is going away regardless here on this property, but I'm a little bit torn there too. And Mayor Cahoon, I, I do a lot of work up in Virginia Beach for stormwater. Same thing has happened up there in that you can't, you have a maximum on pervious or impervious cover. They have stormwater problems. You have the same problems down here. You're exactly right. It's going to cost more and we're struggling with the same thing up there. Perhaps though the town needs to look at it everywhere and not just in this historic district. Then it's an even playing field for people that haven't developed their property. As far as the businesses being damaged, I think I'll throw the press under the bus. I don't think the press has done a good job explaining to folks what's going on. I think Kelly has explained it here today and that they can build back. They're, they're not damaged by that. They can go back with what they had with the non-conforming use, with the non-conforming setbacks, et cetera. So they've kind of got a unique ability in that nobody else can come in if they're a non-conforming use. But that's that's getting more into the details here. Again, I think staff has done a great job with that. Uh, I hope I don't get my neighbors angry here, but again, I'm, I'm torn. This gentleman has owned this property for 23 years. I bought my house knowing full well there was B2 or B2, C2, it's B2 where I am, commercial property in this area. I think staff has come up with a good compromise with the C5 zoning which allows something more of a neighborhood type use in there, as explained, coffee shops, et cetera, something that we can enjoy, but to allow this man who's been paying taxes on it for 23 years to, to use something reasonable. Do you vote on it today? I'm torn there too. I think, I think the businesses are owed probably a, a town hall type hearing where it is explained to them. They can ask all their questions. They don't read something in the paper and not understand it. I do it all the time. Most people don't understand what we do. We have to simplify it and explain it. It's tough to come to a hearing like this and hear differing opinions, hear things for the first time, even though they were legally notified, and not understand it. I think the businesses deserve that, a chance to hear it a little better. And I, again, I hate to say that to my neighbors because I, I drove down here today too for this hearing, but I, I think we need to be fair to the, the businesses. That's where I am on it. Again, I'm torn. Uh, I, I want to be fair. I, want, I, I, I would love for nothing to go there, but that's, that's not fair either. The, the gentleman, <laughs> This gentleman deserves to do something on that property, and particularly since it's been zoned commercial for a long time, he probably should have that right. I, I like the new zoning, the C5, and, and I think that's more appropriate. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Royal. All right, is there anybody else who wishes to provide comment? I do. All right. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners, my name is Cindy Brightbill. I am the sole proprietor of Surfside Plaza Shopping Center. Um, Surfside Plaza Shopping Center 
was the first strip shopping center that was built on the Outer Banks approximately 53, 55 years ago. I currently have 15 individual specialty businesses in the complex, and I myself have been there uh, trading as Surfside Casuals for 48 years. So um, I'm just asking that uh, the consideration be given to uh, these people that have put their hard-earned money into uh, creating a new business in my complex and are working diligently to make a good living on the Outer Banks. <clears throat> we are unique in a way because of uh, there aren't a whole lot of those kind of strip malls. There are strip malls, but not with the type of specialty stores that we have. Um, the customers love it. Uh, the visitors love it. Um, and we've worked real hard in trying to diversify um, our businesses there. So I'm asking that uh, please take all of this into consideration for these hardworking tenants. And uh, a lot of things have been answered at this meeting for me in regards to, you know, uh, a roof blowing off or the, a fire, because it is an old building. But in a way, I'm historical too. <laughs> so is John. <laughs> so maybe uh, <laughs> uh, I appreciate the time and uh, I've enjoyed listening to everything today and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Bright, Bill. All right, any further comment? Good morning. Please excuse my appearance. Um, I'm, my name is Courtney Gallup, and for the record, I reside in the town of Nags Head, and I do have a small business in the town of Nags Head. Um, and I've been watching with great concern and, and, and just great dis distaste, actually, uh, at the progression that we're going in towards the rezoning to C5, to a more restrictive zone. Uh, commercial of the commercial district um, near Hollowell Street. Um, I, I'm very concerned about it. Um, it, it it's a bad look. Um, it, it looks like um, a few property owners are driving the debate. Um, it, it feels rushed. It feels not fully thought out. Um, especially, there's several small business people on this board and to, to, to make a business non-conforming and to present, prevent them from growing or improving or expanding is, is a kiss of death. And it's very anti-American, it's very anti-capitalistic, and um, I just don't see a justification uh, to go in this direction. So I, I would join many people and ask uh, that this um, action be delayed. Um, until the, all the concerns of the bus impacted businesses can be thoroughly assessed. And the, the true motivations of this action should come to light, um, which, which I, I don't think are, are legitimate. Um, as a small business person, uh, my, business was, was, my business in Dare County was threatened with becoming nonconforming. And I, in good conscience, cannot let the same thing happen to some, some of my fellow business people in Nags Head. Um, so I would just ask that this be given much more consideration, uh, much more time, and a much broader look at the implications. And uh, for not only these b individual business owners, but to Nags Head's image, um, Nags Head has, I believe, improved in becoming more business friendly. Um, as in our reputation, we're going in the right direction, I, and this just puts us back light years. So um, please reconsider and delay the decision on the rezoning, if, if at all possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gallo. Good morning, David Bragg, Nag said. I'm kind of taking a different look at this. Uh, going back to the housing issue, I'm, I'm looking around, I don't see, let's see, Rob Ross here or uh, Commissioner Woodard. I believe they came to this board and decided they were going to strong arm the board and have them stop 
the commissioners from looking at this. I would like to uh, remind Commissioner Woodard of Jefferson Wilson Housing in Portsmouth, where he's from, and let him go back and relook at the issues that occurred there. My father-in-law owned the Ace Hardware store there. It was great for him because business was booming because they bought all the supplies and equipment from his business. It was terrible for the city of Portsmouth. Soon after the development started, crime increased, businesses closed down. The eventuality was it was plowed under. So next time the commissioners come and speak to you, I would ask to ask Commissioner Woodard, what happened at Jefferson Wilson in Portsmouth? Thank you for that, if you would do it. I would like to thank the commissioners for taking that stand and having this occur today. I would also like to say I support the local businesses here. I don't think the intent of what was done was to hurt or harm the business. I do agree that it should be probably better thought out and explained to the local business so they, they're not having issues of fear and thinking they may lose their business. A little bit about the lower income housing because if we're looking at $29,000, it's low income. So let's get that right out of the way. I just returned from Florida and when I travel, I talk to the restaurant people, the servers, other people in the area that, that don't live in the area. I ask them, do you live here on the island? And most answer is, are, no, we don't, we can't afford to live here. I say, well, how do you get here to work? Oh, like most people get to work, we drive. What a novel thought. Drive to work and not have to live exactly where you work. Secondly, I'd like to commend some of the business owners, one being on the board here, and others that offer housing to their employees. What a great idea. You bring somebody on the island, you have a house or an apartment for them to use. That's great. It eliminates us having to build this housing. My last point is, I did hear a couple people say, hey, why don't we buy that piece of parcel of land? Let's do it. <laughs> I'm sure we could get a good deal on it right now because it, it, it just got pulled off the market. So let's make an offer. You can't, can't refuse it. We can end this real quick. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bragg. Mr. Harrell's sitting right over there if you're interested in talking about it. <laughs> All right, is there any, any further comment? If not, at this time, we will conclude the public comment session. I will ask uh, whether the commissioners need to receive any other information or clarification or have any further questions for staff before we begin if, deliberations. If I may, John, considering yes, that we have been sitting here for two hours and 45 minutes, you retain that question until we come back from a 15-minute recess. How about we retain the answer until we come back from that? <laughs> no, no. That's fine. The board will be in recess for 15 minutes. Thank you. The board has uh, returned from its recess, and uh, Mr. Lighty, you had a question just before our break as to whether any commissioners, I believe, had questions for staff. That's correct, uh, yes, sir. At this point. So, I think I'm supposed to start at this end. Commissioner Sears, do you have questions for staff? I do. Next, Kelly, please. I don't know who referenced this, but how many special uses um, are outside of the current C5 district or proposed C5 district? How many special uses? Do you know that off the top of your head? So you're saying uses that are maybe permitted in C2 that are special use yes. versus what's in I don't have an exact number, but there's a significant number of uses within the C2 that are special use that are not even permitted or proposed to be permitted in the C5, but I don't have a number for you. And do you, how many of the current businesses in the current C2 are currently possibly non-conforming for any reason? Again, I don't have a number, but I, off the top of my head, I'm. I'm sure there are a significant number of existing businesses in the C2 that have site nonconformities, whether it's parking, lot coverage, overage, something of that nature. 
<laughs> I wasn't trying to call you out. I really wasn't. All right. Thank I you. get it. Thank you. You are. Mr. Cahoon. Um, I think I'm still going to save my comments because I don't really have any questions. Well, yes, I do have a question for Kelly. Of the things that you presented today as possibilities, uh, rebuilding, those type of things, how many of those would require a new public hearing? So the town attorney can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, of the things that we're considering, if if that amendment is less stringent than what the planning board made their recommendation on, it does not have to go back to the planning board. It could be acted upon today. So I think the only, I think everything can be acted on today unless perhaps you are interested in, in changing up the zoning designations of specific properties. And I would defer to, to attorney Lighty. But in terms of the text amendments to the UDO, I think all of those could, could be done today without having to go back to the planning board. And the, one other question, just for clarification, in the chart that you presented that gave everybody square footage, you corrected the uh, Nags Head Cafe parcel property? I did, yes. So it is compliant, not non-compliant, under, under the proposed new zoning? Correct. It, that would be a, a tweak that we would want to make just for clarity to make sure that it's um, the 35 square foot of habitable um, pertains to the essentially the, the use when there's an accessory dwelling associated with it. The only comment, I'll say my comments. Thank you. <laughs> um, there was a proposed amendment to the ordinance in order to preserve the nonconformities and allow them to build back. <clears throat> and I'm not recalling how that was written, but depending on where that goes in the ordinance, if that applied townwide as opposed to C5, you know, then you, then you would ha essentially Essentially, you know, you're, you're trying to eliminate nonconformities is why you have that language in the ordinance. So uh, in this case, we're trying to, we're looking at a class of nonconformities that people may be interested in preserving. So would, is there a way for that language to apply in a district as opposed to townwide? And then is that a legal question as to whether we can do that in a district? That specific question may be better for John Lighty, but I would say my thought process on that was the non-conforming use language, it, as it's proposed, it would be town-wide. And my thought process there was the non-conforming use language as it currently exists, in my opinion, is, is in place when it comes to some of the more egregious non-conforming uses mm -hmm. um, and we've had some of those in town I mean if you were to think about a go-kart track in the middle of a residential district right. um, that's a that's a non-conforming use that that you would want to keep that standard in place for um, there really are no egregious non-conforming uses in the town okay. and to my knowledge the only one that I'm aware of because it comes up pretty often is the H&R block building that's nestled in a residential district right so that's that's the only one that i'm aware of but again since there are no existing egregious non-conforming uses you i, I went ahead and wrote it with the intent that it would apply townwide okay all right thank you um and john i'm going to go ahead and ask you some questions these are going to come up at, at some point but but um one would you address the question of proper notice for this public hearing Yes, the, uh, the, the notice requirements for both the text amendments and the zoning map, uh, map amendment or the rezoning uh, have been met. Uh, they're, they're prescribed by statute, um, and with regard to the uh, notices that must be given for the rezoning, the town is required to give no less than 10 days and no more than 25 days notice so that you've complied with those notice requirements, including 
the, uh, the way in which notice was mailed out to all the property owners in the area and adjacent to the area, <clears throat> and the posting of the notices in various areas uh, along the property to be rezoned. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, the other question that came up, and I, and I believe there was a reference to it this morning, is the issue of spot zoning, and I know that you've looked at this as well. So will you speak to the spot zoning question? Yes, uh, we don't consider this, we don't think there's any a valid basis for this to be considered spot zoning uh, for a variety of reasons, but one of which is, uh, probably the most important of which is that spot zoning generally applies to land that is owned by one owner and land that is owned by multiple owners or that involves multiple lots um, generally would not be characterized as spot zoning. So looking at both the entire area or any of these individual pockets, they are all properties that are owned by multiple <coughs> owners. And so for that reason alone, I think that this would not be considered spot zoning. Okay. Um, and, and the final question for right now um, for, for you is, <clears throat> if the board were to determine that it would like more time on this issue, can the moratorium be extended? I, there's a provision in the general statutes that allows for the extension of a moratorium, but in order to do so, the board would have to make the same original findings that were made as well as additional findings that there are new facts and new conditions uh, that warrant the extension of the moratorium. And I'm not aware of any new facts or new conditions that would support that finding. Okay. I just want to get that out there for the, for the benefit of everybody. Yes, sir. To Mr. Brinkley. Kelly, if, if it was a consensus of the board to look at adopting those amendments and we postponed any action today, could those amendments be added? in time for a mid-month meeting? Um, for your March 15th meeting? If we have one, correct. Yes. Yeah, I, I could probably leave this and give me 30, 40 minutes and I could have, have it back to you before the end of this meeting. Yeah. If, if it could be done I by mid-month. Right. And again, that's just me personally asking that, not knowing what the consensus <coughs> of the board is. Sure, sure. I, I mean, whether you whether you are technically able to do it or not, I personally would not be comfortable reviewing new language and acting on it before I'd been able to give it consideration and read it in the context of the complete ordinance. Commissioner Cahoon, you have another question? Um, it's just a f clarification of Commissioner Brinkley's question, <clears throat> and he was talking about the amendments. If we were to make any changes in the map, that would require a new public hearing, correct? Yes, it would. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Brinkley, anything else? No. Commissioner Sanders? In the C-5, you talked about um, high-intensity use next to residential. What would that, what would the, what would, how would that change the setbacks? It would be more about what um, exactly? So we have a list of what we consider high-intensity uses, things like shopping centers, group developments, things of that nature. If that were to be um, cited, um, adjacent to a residential if it's if it's adjacent to a residential structure on it within a commercial zoning district a 10 foot wide buffer with two rows of plantings will be required however if it's a um, high intensity use adjacent to a residential structure in a residential zoning district it's going to be a 25 foot wide buffer with three rows of plantings so the high intensity use wouldn't be a coffee shop or ice cream shop? Or no. Okay. It's, it's more of the larger, more intense uses, high traffic, things of that nature. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. John, I think we've been through those questions. All right. So no other questions for Ms. Ms. Wyatt? At this time, I think you can conclude the public hearing and begin your deliberations on the various proposed amendments that have been presented. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> um, we can, I think we should just start with discussion because I'm not sure that anybody's ready to uh, put a motion on the table for the purpose of discussion. So, um, you know, we've heard quite a bit from the public hearing this morning. Um, commissioners have um, suggested by their questions and staff by their offering of various amendments that there may need to be modifications to the um, 
to the ordinance that was published. And so um, I think what we probably need to do is go uh, commissioner by commissioner, um, express our concerns and preferences, and then um, see if um, at the end of that discussion, we can bring that into some sort of coherent uh, motion. And I'm due to start on Commissioner Sanders' end of the table this time, I think. I mean, I think all, we've heard all the concerns from everybody that has spoken and the amendments that we've all looked at. And I think we need to pretty much get those amendments in place before we can move forward. Um, I mean, I like what the planning staff has done. I like what the planning board has done. I mean, there's a reason we live in Nags Head. There's a reason we love it, the historic character. But I certainly don't want to penalize any businesses to try to preserve the historic character. So, and I think it's pretty clear that that's our intent, so. Okay, all right. Thank you, Commissioner Brinkley. <clears throat> I want to start by thanking each one of y'all for taking the time out of your day to come speak to us. Those that emailed us that couldn't be here, those that I've spoken to on the telephone, it's been a, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, helped me understand the questions and concerns that each of y'all have expressed either personally uh, to me on the telephone, whether we it was th at the meeting today or through emails. Uh, also, the planning board and planning staff has done an extreme amount of work in a very short period of time. We can say 150 days, but you throw in New Year's, Thanksgiving, and Christmas in there, their days get a lot shorter, and they've done a great deal of work. Kelly and her staff should be commended for that. Um, the concerns that have been expressed about the businesses, we, we need to support the businesses of this, in this area. John Harris is, and, and Kitty Hawk Kites has been a staple in Nags Head a, you know, a very, very long time. Ms. Brightville in Surfside Plaza, a very long time, and we need to put protections in place uh, to look after them. Um, I'm, I'm torn about property along 158 being residential. I, I, I have a personal philosophy that I think that's where your commercial businesses go, um, which takes me back to the owner of the Hollowell Street parcel and the fact that it's been zoned commercial for so many years. And if it's appraised at a higher value as a commercial property versus residential, he's been paying more taxes on that all this, all this time. And that's, that's a, a big, big concern. I do appreciate Kelly coming up with the amendments. Um, I, I support those amendments as presented. Um, and there may be others that want to come forward. Uh, but again, thank you all for talking, for coming today. And uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I would echo those thanks today. There were 25 of y'all by my count who spoke this morning on this topic. Um, and that input is exactly why public hearings exist, and it's been helpful to hear from all of you this morning. Um, you know, for the most part, use is not the thing that we get complaints about, um, and, and what we have in front of us concentrates on, on uses. What we hear about as a board are intensity of use issues, excessive lighting, overflow parking, excessive noise, outdoor display, tree cutting, for the most part, in my recollection, um, use was not a big topic of discussion during the development of the land use plan. It was about building scale, building placement, a lot of talk about how we want the building to look, which is a product of scale and, and building, not, not use in particular. And speakers said this morning that they, that they appreciate the businesses. It was not about the uses. Um, and we have tools to deal with those intensity of development issues. We have buffers, lot coverage, lighting limits, signage limits. Uh, again, the ordinance is, has focused on use. And I think elimination of long-standing uses where property owners have reasonably expected to them to remain in place because those uses have not been a problem um, is, a, is a really draconian step and really ought to be our last resort to resolve problems. Um, even within the proposed ordinance, C5 is described as accommodating neighborhood scale commercial and residential development patterns to protect the surrounding commercial areas. It speaks much more to scale, pedestrian orientation, character view sheds than it does to use, other than the use table. Um, all that said, I personally would prefer an ordinance which leaves the existing uses in place, uh, which again have not been problematic. 
Um, and in the most limited way, to rectify the valid concerns focuses on the intensity of development concerns. Regarding building size, development intensity, and to the extent that they must be dis that we must discuss use, the ordinance already draws some distinctions appropriately between 158, a five-lane thoroughfare, and NC12, a two-lane street. Fronting 158 should be the most intensely developed commercial uses. As Commissioner Brinkley said, that's not the place for residential. I mean, so if not fronting 158, where is a convenience store with gas supposed to go? Where is an indoor public assembly space supposed to go? Where is a shopping center supposed to go? Where are townhouses, if you want them, supposed to go? Um, and I realize um, that there will still be C2 between the highways north and south of the area we're discussing, but we are discussing the middle third of the town. Um, I would prefer an ordinance and a map which permit those most intense uses to remain along 158. Uh, that includes extending C5 along 158 up to Hallwell Street, the property that Commissioner Brinkley referenced. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Commissioner Cahoon. Thank you. I will start by thanking planning staff and the planning board for having so many meetings and working pretty much in a really quick time frame to bring us something back. I would also point out for those of you that are here today, this is the first time this board has met as a body to discuss these proposals and look at them in tandem and talk back and forth. Um, I would also like to thank the people that came out. But as I've looked at this proposal, it's um, taken me back. Um, I've been around a long time, in some cases probably too long. but. Um, the whole reason I got involved in the town back in 1990, 1991, was this exact issue. Um, there was a proposal to um, downzone the oceanfront in my neighborhood. And uh, that created a lot of heartburn for me, so I ended up running for the board and getting elected. Much to a lot of people's sorrow, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, as I look at this, I support a lot of what staff and the planning board has done. <clears throat> Um, they've tried to accommodate and work with it a lot. What I cannot support is um, taking away somebody's commercial property. Um, I think R3 is a perfect designation for Old Axid Place and the Beach Road where it's developed as residential property. Um, and then you go further on into C5. I was happy to see some work by staff to talk about keeping those uses. I have no desire to make a business non-conforming. I know what it's like to, to deal with that. Um, it's not as easy to deal with non-conforming property as everybody thinks. So um, it's really hard. It's one of the things your bank asks you when you go to apply for a loan. Is your property non-conforming? And it makes a difference. Bob understands that. And we all, we've managed to work within the parameters that the town has given us. And uh, hopefully we'll work for another, a lot longer few years. But I would like to see staff bring forward those um, items that would keep those businesses there. Um, if they're conforming now, I don't want to see them made non-conforming. Um, if they're there, such as some of the uses aren't allowed perhaps, but still want you to stay, John. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's not my desire to make it harder for you to do your, do your business or you send either one. Thank you. Um, because um, I know Cindy's use right now is permitted. I would hate to see it become non-permitted, as well as any of the other small businesses as well. And I consider all these businesses small businesses. Um, they're not a big box store, which NAG said has worked very hard to limit. That's why we adopted a 20,000 square foot size limit, even after we got some big box stores. Um, so I would like to see us move forward. Um, but I do want to um, not get into a box by um, not being able to extend the moratorium. But I would like to see something brought back. Um, I believe our moratorium expires by our mid-month meeting in March, I believe. That's correct. Um, March 17th. I'll respectfully disagree with the attorney about extensions <laughs> <laughs> that I think we have. This board has learned new facts even from the proposal about what we're doing. 
um, that we had not in the days until this meeting, and then we got our packet last week, that um, some of the different things that were coming about with the C5, how far it extended, what the different uses would be. So I, to me, those are substantial changes. Um, maybe they're not. John's made that opinion, but um, wouldn't hurt my feelings to extend the moratorium for another 30 days. But I would like to have staff bring us something back, as Kelly described this morning. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to be in favor, I'll tell you right now, of the Hollowell Street property that fronts 158 that's not developed as residential becoming a C5. Um, I think that's the most fair proposal that I've seen for that particular designation from Beach Road to Bypass, R3 on the Beach Road and C5 on the Bypass. I think commercial, small business commercial, I think small business mixed use is a viable, viable use. I think people that build small businesses and then residential on the top to either live in or house their employees is a good use for the town in Axe Head. It gives you space to have employees as well as have a business. I think that's, rather than being repetitive, I think that's my comments, Mayor. Thank you. Yeah. The hard part is, it's always repetitive when you're the last one. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank the I want to thank the staff, um, the planning board, the community for being involved in this, especially um, those who have been involved from the very beginning. Um, it's a lot of work and a lot of time, a lot of thought. Um, yesterday, I think I recorded 11 hours on the phone over this topic alone, so it's been exhausting. Um, I have to agree with a little bit of what everybody said as far as uh, all the way up and down the line. It is not easy and definitely as a business owner as well don't want to see the businesses restricted from anything that they're doing but you also have to look at, at um, the growth as we move forward. Most of us in this room won't be here in 35 years. I hate to say that even Mr. Shields back there probably one of the youngest ones here won't be here in 35 years. <laughs> um, but the truth of the matter is we have to look at what's best for the community overall. Keeping the businesses here, keeping that separation. I think um, Commissioner Brinkley may have mentioned or, or Sanders may have mentioned it. We got to go further apart to have that residential and commercial being. And if we went back to the 60s, the 70s, the 80s when some of these other folks were here, we probably wouldn't be talking about the same topic of workforce housing. We'd have put that in the place at a much better level where somebody that made more than $15 an hour could actually live in it. Um, so there's a lot to be seen yet with what you've mentioned with these amendments and I'd like to see that come back at the mid-month meeting before I made a final decision. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, Kelly, could I get you to come back, please? And so, since we are talking about it sounds like the direction from the board, and this remains to be seen, but it sounds as if the direction from the board is going to be to um, incorporate the amendments, address the language, either, either reinsert ex existing uses that would have been non-conforming as permitted uses, or create language to allow them to um, remain one or the other um, and we'll figure that out in a few minutes but it sounds like we're interested in incorporating the amendments that you presented toward the beginning of the meeting and I think it's important that we see those again before because they they need to be part of a motion if that's where we go to direct this to staff to incorporate these and so can we get those back up so that we can run through them quickly So I pulled it up for you and we can, I don't know if you just want to start from the top and work down. Well, we, we discussed map amendments. I think we're going to circle back to that okay. in, in a little bit. Um, the, the lot coverage, um, 
I would guess if we're going to send this back to the board, what is the board's thinking on the lot coverage issue? Um, and let, let's not do that right now. So, so lot co lot coverage. The question of do we remain with the originally recommended um, forty percent? 50% with permeable paving, or do we change those numbers? Um, do we add these uses back to the C5 district? And those that are listed there are retail shopping center, if you can scroll down, group development, mixed use development, commercial with accessory residential, and I think those are all the ones Commissioner Cahoon just listed. Um, actually, which is pretty darn good. Um, permitting the proposed uses within the C5 district as currently permitted. Um, and so that would mean that those uses that are not, that were cited as non conforming would not be non conforming if they were added back. So that would be shopping center, convenience store. Yeah, with with I mean, fueling and convenience and, store with gas station, I think. Yeah, was yeah. and and maybe there may be a couple of others, but essentially those that were. No, I'm sorry, there were only two. That's right, we did that at the beginning. There were two. That was the shopping center, the two shopping centers, and the two gas states gas station slash convenience stores. Yes. Uh, no, John, I'm sorry. Um. Scroll on down, see if there was anything. Is there anything else? Um, if we put those uses back so that they are no longer non conforming, do we need this language about non conforming uses of structures? Don't we already have that? Well, aren't you proposing to do that? Don't we already look at that town-wide anyway? Well, the, the terminology in red, those last two paragraphs were going to be new um, to accommodate any non-conforming uses that we created, but it sounds like we may be leaning towards not creating any non-conforming uses. Okay. Yeah. So we probably would not need that additional language in red. Okay. Okay. All right. K keep scrolling, Kelly. Is that it? That that was it. And then um, I just don't don't forget to wrap in at some point the conversation of do we keep things permitted via permitted by right versus special use consistent with the C two or do something right. different? Right. Okay. And, and 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 that ordinance additionally. Okay. So we're talking about the ordinance that we had it with those modifications. And I think the most debatable question is the map amendment. Do we modify that parcel to make that C5? Um, I heard three who expressed interest in that, but um, you know, we can, we can talk further about that. So Commissioner Cahoon, you Matt, said you had a suggestion. I do, I have a couple of questions. One is when does the planning, the planning board meets the third Tuesday they do, so that's going to be the 21st After. of March. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, but I would, I guess I'd actually finish the conversation. John, I have a question for you as I move forward. I support everything, hang on a second. I support everything that Kelly has shown up there. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only question I have is the law coverage, and I'll work with the rest of the board but I do support the, all the other things that she had set up there. Um, and then I'll wait till we give direction to say the other thing. Okay. All right. It's coming, John. My question's ready right. for John. Okay. As and it comes up. John, you may have had further thought about this. The moratorium. Yes, sir. Is there anything that would constitute um, oh. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes, Commissioner. I Kane. think that one question that, that I just consulted with the attorney about may preclude the issue of the moratorium is that one of the things, the elephant in the room perhaps, 
um, we've taken some other actions that preclude multifamily housing. Right. So the expiration of the moratorium would not impact that at all. Correct. That, that, that's, that's, that's correct. And I, you know, I've, it, as I've thought about this over the last several days, I've kind of wondered why we felt hung to the, you know, bound to the more expiration of the moratorium for action because the thing that got everybody excited from the beginning is not on the table um and, and so um you, you know you don't seem to be at real high risk to go 30 days when you're not going to get a multifamily project anyway and we don't to, allow them and we don't and when we don't allow them so it's not part of the it's not part of the question so if the moratorium expires mm -hmm it's potentially less harm than it would have been otherwise. I would say, just, just to be fair, that there were other commercial development pressures that also weighed in favor of adopting the moratorium. Yes. Um, and I think a lot of those are being addressed by these proposed amendments. Right. Yes. So I'll ask, is there anybody who's willing to take a stab at crafting a motion? May I make another ch yes, may sir. I request for the board's pleasure if I make another change or request a change, can we change STRs from per permitted use to special use in C5? What's that? Short-term rentals. Short-term rentals from permitted use. <clears throat> to special use in C5. There's five houses in C5 that are currently there. We can make them special uses. Would we be eliminating them otherwise? If we, I don't know. Would be if you took it from special use to permitted use. Would you be eliminating five houses that are in that C5 district as rental property? I don't think so. I'd have to yeah. ask Kelly that question. Well, I guess um, any current short-term rentals. Let me stop. I understand that our registration program is not currently in place, but for those who have previously registered their short-term rental, if we're aware of that, if we have their registration and we know that it is being operated within the C5 district, um, if you were to make the change from permitted to special use, essentially those that are already there could continue um, but any new requests any new to operate short-term rental would have to come before the planning board and board of commissioners. And was that your intent? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool with that. Well, if you owned a short-term rental and we made this change, that seems like a substantive change that you would want to be aware of before the town adopts an ordinance. She just doesn't, it doesn't affect her, any of them. They're all grandfathered in. That's what she just said. Well, they would become non-conforming. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. We'll let that slide. Something that should go back to the planning board. Yeah. Okay. Doing the same thing. yeah. Well, we, I can have that prepared for their March twenty-first. You can always add that. Yeah, that'd be better. <clears throat> okay. So we could thinking of the way that we do this today, uh, we could incorporate that subject to planning board approval. Don't even incorporate it in it. We'll, we'll do bring it, it up as an okay. advisement to, to the planning board. Then okay. all we need to do today is send back what we agreed to I, up here. I, yes, I think that's mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you want to try that? <laughs> <laughs> I make a motion that we ask staff to bring back at our March meeting the changes that were incorporated up on Kelly's screen with the deletion of, I believe, the last red line paragraph to work with those definitions that were in the white paper that you presented about conforming versus non-conforming, permitted versus non-permitted uses and bring us back for consideration at our March 15th meeting. Okay. And what about a map change? Um, I'll address that in a minute. Okay. All right. So that's, that is the motion then is to incorporate these changes as the commissioner described into the ordinance. Is there a second for that? I'll second it for the purpose of discussion. Okay. I'm going to have another second motion after this one okay. that will deal with the map. Mine just has to do with, mine's going to deal with the map. 
Okay. And mine's up there on the, what she okay. has. Okay. 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 Is the information right. about this not requiring the special use permit included in her presentation? My thought was that we were, we could just go back and amend it so that any use that we had currently said that it was a special use permit, we would make it consistent with the C2. So there just, are- Just so nothing changes with them being right. required to jump through more hoops, just keep it the way Correct. it was. If it were permitted in the C2, it will then be permitted in the C5. If it were special use in the C2, we'll keep it as a special use in the C5. And that's part of her motion, correct? That was my motion. That's yeah. perfect. As Thank the you. planning director presented. Okay. All right. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. Indulge me? Yes. Uh, John, if we take a look at the map um, and we decide to extend the boundaries of that map, is that considered spot zoning? Extending the map, one way or another, is that? Extending the, the boundaries. The boundaries of the maps that we see. Of the areas that are being rezoned? Yes. That would not necessarily be spot zoning. Okay. If it right. was one property, would it be considered spot possibly. zoning? Or could be considered Could possibly zoning. be considered spot zoning if it was one property. Property owned by one, regardless of size, property owned by one owner, there would be the likelihood of that being spot zoning. Okay. I can still make the motion. I'm going to make a motion that we send back to the planning board the map and ask them to relook at their designations as they presented to us um, in particular. And I'm going to identify Hollowell Street to go perhaps from R3 to C5 um, and get their input back on that after they have a chance to debate it and look at it. Okay. Second. A second. For discussion yes. purposes, Mr. Sears, will you add to that with the inclusion of John to research whether or not that is spot zoning? Yes. I still second. Uh, we understand you second, but I just want to make sure. Absolutely. I don't want to vote on anything that would. That's why I sent it back to the planning board to take a look at it and give us back their recommendation. And that was my question about the high intensity use as to the buffer zones against the residential so as to protect some of the people in the old Nags head place and what the buffers would be and if we could keep some of that existing vegetation or it would just depend on the use that goes in there. The way the ordinance is currently written, it would depend on the use. Um, the, the commercial transitional protective yard would only apply to a high intensity use, but even if it's not a high intensity use, there's some other commercial requirements. There's some vegetate, you either preserve 10% of your vegetation or plant 15%. Um, there's buffer requirements where there's parking adjacent to rights of ways. So there's other opportunities to require landscape buffering. Um, should it not, be a um, one of those intense uses. Uh -huh. so I don't. Um, I don't know if you would like for us to consider revisions with regard to that. I as might well. want to look at some language for that to protect that. Planning board can bring back. Look yeah. at that and bring back. Okay. okay. So the commercial transitional protective yard, high impact use. Okay. And I would also encourage. Um, people that were interested to come to the planning board and express their views as well, whether it be the owner of the property or anybody else. I don't think no, any of that, that changed that the motion. That wasn't a motion. So, that, wasn't so a, the, that was my right, discussion. So, yes, thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you. Now. I have one more comment, yes. sorry. Sure. No, and then I have as, a question. as we look at the maps that were presented today, I know that several property owners came to the town and asked to have their property rezoned to R3. Nothing precludes any other owner from coming and talking to staff about other rezonings as well. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Do we need, should in the case of whether there would be a map amendment, do we need a public hearing at the March meeting? 
Um, the planning board won't have heard it by then. They would have to. It'll be April. Uh, I'm sorry. May meeting. Uh, April. April meeting. April meeting. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's, that's correct, because this is March. I'm sorry, I'm still thinking I'm in February. It's just March. So it would be the April 1st meeting, or the, the first meeting in April. If you're going to consider any other zoning. Should we go ahead and schedule a public hearing? or I can schedule. Can you schedule that at the 15th and have a good month? What I was going to suggest is that we, um, I mean, I think this is the effect of what you're doing, but I think it's, I think it's appropriate to... Uh, to announce that you're going to table any action on any of these proposed amendments until that meeting, the, the mid-month meeting, the March 15 meeting. Um, I just think we need to make that clear for the public that there will be no actions taken today or later today on those items. But with regard to taking any further action on the zoning map, I think that may have to go back and we have to redo the whole notice process. Okay. Once, once we've heard the uh, planning board, uh, once the planning board is considered. Okay. All right. So there's no need to preemptively try to schedule any any hearings okay I'm all right done. thank you i believe that brings us to the end of that item Does with, it with that said i would just say this mr mayor if i may i'd like to reopen the public hearing and just announce that the board is tabling any action on the various proposed amendments until the march 15 meeting okay all right thank you Thank you, John. Yeah. Is that the right what date? March 15th? March 15th for what we did. Today's March 1. It's going to be two weeks from the day. Yes. Yeah. That's right. It's March 15th. Okay. All right. And then we can conclude the public hearing again. Okay. All right. And with the conclusion of the public hearing, it being 1244, the board will take a lunch recess at this point. Thank you. board has returned from its lunch recess um, and this is going to bring us to item G um, update from the planning director so Kelly you should just pitch 10 this is the Kelly well, I mean, huh? it's yeah. I, don't, I don't walk well in heels anyway but <laughs> all over there I might be out of breath at this point um, <clears throat> all right Okay. Um, so there's not really a whole lot to go over that we haven't already spoken about. Obviously, at their last planning board meeting, the um, uh, focus was on. Well, we actually we didn't recap um, the C5 amendments. We had sent those out earlier, so they had already had a chance to lay eyes on that. What we did do um, was to discuss a potential text amendment as it concerns habitable building area, habitable living space, and finished space, um, and sort of the discrepancies that we're seeing with how our ordinances apply to short-term rentals versus two-family dwellings or duplex uses. Um, so we just initiated that conversation, really. Um, provided them with some slides and some information for them to just sit on and um, then at our next meeting we'll dig a little bit deeper into that. Um, Deputy Planning Director Kate Jones provided the planning board with an update on the ETIP program, um, much like the one that you received at your February meeting. <clears throat> and coming up at the planning board's March 21st meeting, uh, they do have a vested right conditional use site plan amendment that they're going to look at from Albemarle and Associates um, from on behalf of Nags Head Church. They're looking to expand their parking lot pretty significantly um, to the rear and it's uh, kind of interesting. They own a long skinny piece of property that goes um, back to Soundside Road and so they're looking at some improvements to that. Um, which is pretty substantial and uh, no board of adjustment items to talk about the decentralized wastewater management um, plan and the septic health advisory committee so they're going to meet on March 7th just to acclimate the four new members um, with where we're at um, the estuarine shoreline management plan obviously this board adopted that at their last meeting 
EV. Um, we are looking into applying for some grant money through the Volkswagen settlement program. Um, additional monies became available there, and so Kate's working on that application now. <coughs> Dune management cost share, I think you're going to be hearing from maybe um, town manager or Kate later on this, but <coughs> we're out of money <laughs> again. So, um, and we landed with 82 property owners um, taking advantage of it. So should there be more money allocated to that program, um, I feel certain that it will be taken advantage of. Um, nothing really to report out on the dog park and Dowdy Park, obviously, you got a great update um, from Art and Culture earlier today. One thing that's not in your packet, and I did want to mention and just give a shout out to our planning staff, is I very rarely talk about the um, monthly reports that are included in here. But when you look at this one, the month of January, we issued 74 permits, which is the most amount of permits that we have issued as long as Lily's been working here in one month. Wow. And our turnaround time was two days. Wow. So, nice. Very nice. nice. Um, very good. I don't want to jinx this, but I did want to acknowledge um, that I was really proud of them for doing that. So. Yes. And that's all I have, unless you have questions. Great job on the turnaround. Yeah, just keep that awesome. up. That's awesome. Thank you. Anything else, board? No, thank you. <coughs> All right. Thank you, Kelly. All right. That takes us to consideration of additional funding for the Dune Management Program. Eight. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. I am here before you to discuss um, and request that uh, the following uh, additional funds be made to the Dune Management Cost Share Program. This has been an incredibly successful program. We have, at least at the time of my memo, <clears throat> and it's increased since, but we've had um, 82 requests uh, of grant applications and um, a total of uh, 269,500 uh, requests for sand relocation and then an additional 3,000 for only planting. So you can see this is a very popular program um, and we're getting a lot of interest. We would request that um, in light of the sand relocation season ex um, deadline, you know, to permit that is April 15th and the work be complete by April 30th. So we'd like to request an additional um, $50,000 to hopefully get us to, you know, the end of that permitting, um, permitting season for sand relocation. I think people would really appreciate that. Um, in that, that additional help in, in paying for those services. As you may remember, and I provided a chart on your page two of your memo, um, owners would be able to apply for this funding once every three years. So they've applied this year, they wouldn't be eligible to apply again for another three years. Um, at least that's the way the program is written right now. So I just wanted to remind you guys of that. Um, so we have, um, we have begun to disperse the money uh, but uh, as usual, we, we do expect a lot of people wait to do their sand relocation towards the end of the season. So we expect a really big push um, with getting these funds to people soon. That is um, pretty simple, um, pretty simple presentation. If you guys have specific questions on the program itself or any of the statistics, just let me know and I will, um, I will get those answered for you. Where does the extra money get moved from? That's an Amy question. Mm -hmm. Amy. <coughs> from where does the extra money get moved? Excuse yeah. me. The extra, good afternoon. The extra 50000 uh -huh. Um So we under budgeted the amount <coughs> of FEMA money and NC um, EM money. So we have actually received more money than we budgeted for grant. So I just upped the revenue for the grant amounts to cover okay. it. Very good. Do, do we know how many ocean fronts have applied and how many are left? That's I mean, a we good track question. In, we track in that question because if it's a three year, every three year program and we got 90% of them out this year, the next year's budget, you could budget lower in the following right. year as well. 
Right. So we do have, at the end of the season, we have everything in an Excel spreadsheet that's easy to you know, export, and then we could look and see what properties are left, what addresses are left. So we, we could easily come up with that number. I think that'd be a good thing to do at the end of the season. It's probably less than a fifth of the owners on the oceanfront right now, the 82. I think there's probably at least 600 oceanfront properties in the town. I just remember from some <coughs> MSD stuff. <coughs> follow-up question to Commissioner Sears' question and we can we'll see from the spreadsheet once it's all said and done are they geographically concentrated I mean is this tackling a problem that's primarily in one concentrated in one area of the town I would say the majority of the 82 are are in the southern portion of town so South Knox head okay yep where you've had beach nourishment more gotcha because it's the blowing sand that Seem, we have a, I mean, we, we do have, I don't want to say we don't have any, we do have some further north, um, especially in some of the condominium units yeah. that are across the street and around. Um, well, so we certainly have those. I know the, uh, the Rascos have contacted me the last two years at least about their cottage mm -hmm. and having, you know, a lot of costs to move sand in the spring. And I told them, I said, well, you know, we're going to have a program if you need some you want some help and mm -hmm. so I'm just kind of curious as to whether they they've reached out or not I can check the spreadsheet yeah that would be good check. thank you okay <clears throat> uh, I guess we need a motion yes I make a motion to adopt uh, budget nur beach nourishment maintenance capital project ordinance amendment number eight was presented thank you sir second second <clears throat> any further discussion Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Kate. Appreciate much. that. Um, that brings us to H1, discussion of beach concierge ordinance changes. Is this you, Andy? Yes. So we've talked with the board several uh, months about this. Uh, back in December, we actually had a meeting with the beach concierge uh, vendors uh, to discuss the prior season and the, and the regulations um, not only to, to talk about the regulations, but just how our experience uh, was with them the last season and some of the things we might need their help with in, in complying with the rules. We got a lot of good feedback. Uh, not all the vendors showed up. We had a, a handful of vendors. Uh, one in particular pr provided the most feedback, um, and that, that has resulted in the ordinance that we're, we've drafted for you. Um, not really a lot of changes to the, the existing ordinance. Um, I would say the most substantial change is they, you know, one of the, the first points that was pointed out by uh, Deputy Chief Chris Montgomery in the meeting was that um, we find them in the beach accesses <laughs> later in the morning and they start to compete with parking with some of the, um, the beachgoers. And so one of the solutions to that would obviously be to allow them to, to go out a little bit earlier. The ordinance currently prohibits them from setting up anything at 7 a.m., so that's when they, they can't get started till 7. So by the time they're done setting, setting everything up, it's probably 9 o'clock or so, and allowing them to set up a little bit earlier would help them. Um, and we also talked about the time of day uh, when they have to break it down. Um, they, they would uh, certainly appreciate being able to go later into the evening because, again, in, earlier in the evening, they still compete with beachgoers. <laughs> You know, if they can keep things out there until eight, then they're not having to. Um, do you have a question? No, I'm going to ask one. Go ahead. They're, you know, they're they're not having to compete as much for for the beach access space. Um, so our goal is is obviously to keep the beach access as free and open. And um, eight p.m. is the time limit in our ordinance that anybody uh, who has a private tent has to remove it off the beach so this would just make it consistent with with that um, and currently any private uh, person has to remove things by 7 a.m. or can't set it out until 7 a.m. Um, we would also propose to, to change that as well so that both of these ordinances are consistent um, so it would be 6 a.m. in the morning to set things out for not only the concierge services but also any private person and then at 8 p.m. to take it off uh, for anyone now for private uh, people the ordinance says that it can't be left unattended so you know 8 p.m. would be the time where you couldn't have it out if it wasn't being attended 
But if you were with the tent, there's no limit on how late you can keep the tent out if you're with it as a private individual. Um, the other thing we talked about was the, the uh, limitations on signage. Um, there was some discussion and maybe some confusion about that in the past. Uh, the, the language for the signage was in our zoning ordinance. So we went ahead and added that language to the ordinance itself. Uh, and we talked about um, what the ordinance said. I think everybody has a, a clear understanding of how the measurements are calculated. So th that language was added. Um, we, we put some more clarity in there about um, putting things out on the beach, uh, you know, for someone who is basically trying to solicit business on the beach. You know, they're not allowed to set any equipment out uh, and, and solicit business on the beach. It has to be for someone who's got a, a prearranged um, contract with them for the equipment. So we've clarified some of that language. And then the main thing that we put in here, um, which leads us to our discussion from last season, was the more teeth in the ordinance in terms of um, the, when, when someone would be, would either receive a violation or a warning or possibly have their permit revoked. And so that, that has been and clarified, and I think the vendors all understand that we need to have a way to deal with issues uh, for folks that won't comply with the ordinance. The main thing with that was folks who were leaving things out overnight and or chaining things to, to sand fencing. And so this gives us a little bit more um, teeth to that, and it makes it more clear for the vendors on what's going to result in, in a, a penalty or a revocation of a permit. And with any of that, you know, we, we feel like you need to build in some due process. And so it does have a way to appeal. If, you get, if you're going to get your permit revoked, it, it has a way to appeal that. Um, and we hope it certainly doesn't come to that, but um, th this would be built in in case we needed to go in that direction. So with that said, uh, we would ask the board to consider these changes and, um, and wrap this item up. Okay. Commissioner Cahane, you had a question. Uh, yeah. They must have it off by 8 o'clock or they can still start breaking down at 8 o'clock? It's got to be off the beach at 8 o'clock. Okay. And the, okay. All right. Thank you. And <clears throat> have we, we talked to, excuse me, Go ahead. Nope. have we talked to the providers? We, we had a meeting with the vendors back in December. And how many were, were they all there? Were some there? It was some, it was some of them. All of them who had current permits were, they, were invited, but only about half of them showed up. And their input to this change? Well, the, the biggest piece to this is, is the, the time of day. You know, that's what they really wanted our help with. Um, and then, you know, on our end, the biggest change was when there would be a penalty or, or possible revocation <clears throat> of the permit. Um, and there is one thing that they asked for uh, regarding the height of canopies. Uh, Previously, it said they couldn't be taller than nine feet. Based on some of their equipment, they asked that we raise it to 10 feet, and um, we didn't really have a problem with that, so we put that in here as well. And that would apply to anybody who has a private tent. There's two, there's two separate sections to the ordinance. One is <coughs> Chapter 12, which deals with the beach equipment concierge services. The other is Chapter 8, which just deals with uh, any beachgoer. When you had presented that John Hill had met with them in December, and you talked about the ones not being there, and we have one particular vendor that maybe uh, likes to skirt the rules a little bit, and I had asked that whenever you came up with something, that even though they were not part of the group, that they were sent the proposal. Were they sent this? Yes. Yeah, Chris Trembley took care of that, and he sent it back to every person who was invited. We, we did not get a response from them, but he did send it to just, them. Just so we, we could say we got it, and they, yes. and they mm -hmm. understood. Thank you. We don't regulate placing beach equipment seasonally, do we? No, no, this is this has no seasonal component. Okay. I mean, it hasn't been a problem, but we've had some nice days where 6 p.m., you know, since it's 6 p.m., 8 p.m. would be way past dark. And it's not a problem until it's a problem. I'm just, and, and it's I been, really it's been 8 p.m. and the one ordinance that deals with the general public has been 8 p.m. <coughs> it's only the concierge services that were required to remove it by 6 p.m. Okay. And so we just made them consistent. Yeah. The That's other problem right. that I see is not the beach concierge, it's the wedding venues that put stuff on the beach. 
just traipsing all over private property. I think they're a problem. And remind, somebody remind me to what extent are they required to have a permit for an event on the beach? Like I don't a think they are. They're not. It would be a crowd gathering permit for any group lar larger than a hundred. Okay. Yeah. That's... So small weddings or not. So they just traipse all over to drop their equipment off and pick it up. Yeah. Do you think That's... we could get the town to send something to the wedding association to get to their members that would remind them that they're not able to go across private property and regardless of how far they got to lug it down the beach, they can't do private property. They're subject to arrest. Certainly do that. I mean, That'd be yeah, great. Let's do that. That's been a problem. Okay. Uh, Mayor, I'll make, Mayor, I'll make a motion. Okay. I make a motion that we adopt an ordinance amending the town code of ordinance, chapter 12, businesses and licensing, and chapter eight, beaches and waterways, as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor <coughs> signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. Beach holes, Andy. Okay, so this is something you talked about last month. Um, and as the board is aware, the board had requested that we look into creating a, a state law that would make it unlawful to um, leave an abandoned beach hole on the beach uh, greater than a certain size. Obviously, these were identified as significant public uh, safety hazards. We uh, reached out to many of the other towns along the coast and received support uh, for this effort. Uh, we received several resolutions. Uh, the communities are all listed in the resolution in your packet. Uh, John Lighty, our town attorney, helped put this language together. We presented it last month. I think the board pointed out some issues with, with what we had, so we've, we've got some revisions here for you to consider. Um, I did share it with the mayor earlier uh, since he had the concern about the language, and uh, he, he seemed okay with the changes we've proposed here, so now it's before the whole board, uh, and essentially says that it, it's gonna be a vi violation, and this would be a, a criminal penalty uh, to leave an abandoned beach hole um, that would be at least 18 inches deep and greater than 12 inches wide, or at least 24 inches wide and greater than 12 inches deep. Uh, so that, that should make it fairly clear in, in both circumstances, either width or depth on what constitutes a violation. And I did talk to Chad Motes, our ocean rescue supervisor, as well as our chief of police about this. And I think that they both agree that this language is, is workable. And it's not a crime until they walk away and leave it. I mean, just digging the hole is not a problem. Leaving it unattended. Leaving it unattended. Which, you know, if you're on the beach, I think there's an argument you're still attending to it if you're yeah, in, the, right. in the vicinity. It's when you go back up to the cottage. Yep. And I think, see, the problem there is how are you going to enforce it when they're, you want to charge or consult with or tell somebody they got to fill it in when they're no longer there? Unless you can get everybody's name that's digging a beach hole. Yeah. <laughs> and the location, which we're not going to do. come back, right. I mean, I'll, I'll support the resolution, but I think it's, it's one of those ordinances or laws, if it's, if it's created, that's unenforceable, in my opinion. But I do see the intent. Yeah. You know, the other, the other thing that we could do, and we have a town code that also has regulations for beach holes um, which allows us to issue a civil penalty or a warning. Um, and it, that, that is a little bit more um, comprehensive, I would say, in terms of our ability to deal with it. This is, this is something that just deals with abandoning, abandoning the holes, but our ordinance basically says we could go and tell someone to fill it in if it becomes too dangerous. Um, I, I think that the issue is that and, and there would probably be very few situations where if we told someone to fill in a hole that they wouldn't comply. Um, and so, you know, at what point would you actually issue somebody a citation or even a civil penalty for a beach hole? Um, it would only be the situation where they may <coughs> be combative and refuse to do it. Um, so it, from a practical standpoint, that's where we're at. I think, I think Commissioner Brinkley's point is well taken, but I also think that the, I, I think enforcement may be less important than deterrence. And that is that, you know, when, when people, when um, 
uh, lifeguards and others with uh, authority are on the beach and they see somebody digging a hole who hasn't abandoned it yet, they can just explain to them, you need to make sure you fill that in before you leave. And that may be, just like you said, that may be the most important aspect of this, yeah. you know, telling them that well, you know, it's, a state, it's a violation of state law not to if you don't do that. Maybe that would be enough incentive for people to actually do it and not leave it unattended. <clears throat> and it draws yeah. attention to it. People do it without thinking. Yeah. A lot of people just don't even think. Yeah. I don't know if anybody saw the posting from Chicken McComico um, yesterday. Another one of those holes you could stand in. You know, it's just nuts. Okay. Well, then if we're interested, a motion would be in order. Make a motion that we approve or adopt the resolution as presented. Thank second. you. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing not, all of those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you. Now we'll leave it up to the legislature <coughs> to deal with it or not. <clears throat> that brings us to new business uh, committee reports. Uh, I think I'm supposed to start down here. Commissioner Sanders, anything to report? No. Mr. Brinkley? Yes, sir. Are you all meeting? Is the, is, has Jeanette and Peter, you guys are still meeting? We're still meeting, but we have not met yet. Hasn't met yet. Yes, okay. sir. Commissioner Cahoon. Nothing, thank you. I missed um, last meetings of the COVID TV. Okay. Sorry. I was out of town both times. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> Commissioner Sears. Yeah, nothing at this time. All right. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right, uh, that brings us to consideration of a request for costs from TFC. Who's doing this, Andy? Is this you? Me again. <laughs> um, as, as noted in the staff report, uh, we did receive a request for an increase from the TFC Recycling, our subscription recycling vendor. Um, this is based on language in our current franchise agreement and contract that allows them to request a, a cost increase uh, each year of the contract, as long as they can show that the consumer price inje index for garbage and trash uh, has increased over the prior year, uh, they can request up to 5% per year. Um, they note in their email to us that the CPU was 6.1% for the prior year, so they are requesting the 5%. As you recall, they did this last year. Um, we obviously have had high inflation both years. Um, Hopefully in the future, depending on how inflation goes, we wouldn't see this every year, but unfortunately we have seen this two years in a row. Um, the cost per month per unit would be $15.33 in total. However, the town does subsidize the cost of the recycling at $5 per unit per month. So the cost to the property owner would be $10.33 per month. And so uh, we are recommending approving this because it is part of the language in our contract yeah. and is this did you tell me this is the last year of this contract i'm looking for the date but yes i believe okay. it is <clears throat> just for reference well i mean i will say as one of their customers i i don't object to the 33 cent a month still worth it save me a trip to the recycling center I certainly pay it, and I think they provide a good service. And I think the manager had to have some conversation with the company about the aggressiveness of their drivers, the drivers in yes. the early morning hours. <laughs> yes. My ear got bent quite a bit from people that were walking and running in the neighborhood. My wife bent mine, so <laughs> I said something too. Motion to approve as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And Mr. Mayor, if I may, I'll just point out that um, the, the agreement does expire in May of 2024. Mm -hmm. There is a right to, there's, a, there's an option to renew for a term to be agreed upon by the parties. So uh, this, okay. this is locking in for the next, the next year. Okay. All right. Thank you. That brings us to items referred to and presentations <laughs> from the town attorney. Anything other than the closed sessions? I do have one thing. Uh, Y'all probably have all seen uh, the news information about the, uh, the Fourth Circuit's opinion in the no mid Curry Tuck County um, uh, bridge case, but the Fourth Circuit did rule on that case uh, last week and uh, upheld the trial court's decision that the, um, that the uh, permits had been, or, I'm sorry, that the environmental study had been properly conducted and that no further studies were needed at that time. So 
that essentially helps pave the way for this project to move forward, um, at least with regard to the legal challenge that had been filed by the Southern Environmental Law Center. Um, the, uh, the, the, the decision is subject to further review either at the Fourth Circuit itself if the uh, petitioners, the plaintiffs, if they uh, seek further review by the Fourth Circuit uh, as an entire body, or they have uh, the option of seeking uh, discretionary review with the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, that would have to be filed within 90 days. Um, uh, so, and it's unclear what they're going to do at this point. I've not heard anything further, but I just wanted to point out that that decision did come down the pike, but there could be some further proceedings. In. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to uh, item two, which is a um, request to vacate a portion of Turnstone Avenue. Did we skip one? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we did. I'm sorry. We jumped over a big one. I'm sorry. Uh, this would be items referred to in presentations from the town manager review or expansion of the Good Samaritan law. Andy. Thank you, Mayor. We, we the county uh, adopted a resolution in February requesting that the legislature look at the Good Samaritan law, acknowledging that the law has not been updated in several years and there's probably several, several revisions that need to be made to it. Uh, I've included a copy of that law in your packet and in short, it allows someone to, to seek help for somebody who's overdosed uh, using drugs and, um, and, and not risk prosecution in, in, the, in their attempt to do that. Um, the existing law covers certain substances, I believe cocaine and heroin, uh, but there's a lot, of, a lot of new things now that are more problematic. And I may ask Chief Perry Hale if he could come up and, and help with this. He's certainly had more experience with this than I have. Um, one of the things we talked about, I talked to the mayor about this and how to handle this. One of the things we, we talked about was perhaps writing a letter uh, from the town as opposed to doing a resolution, um, <coughs> maybe getting some assistance from staff on the language for that and circulating it out to the board before it, it goes forward. But um, I think generally speaking, it's probably a, a good initiative to go back and look at the law, but there, there may be some things that we want to exercise caution on. However, uh, Perry can talk about that a little bit. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Um, as the manager said, um, the county came up with a resolution and looking at it, and I know he said that uh, he's got an overview of the law in there. Um, within the law, um, there were some good things uh, that were there that if someone um, acted as a good Samaritan and sought medical attention, um, either by calling 911 EMS or contacting law enforcement directly for somebody who had overdosed, it would provide immunity um, <clears throat> to the caller and to the overdose victim. Um, within that, they had to act in good faith uh, in seeking medical assistance, being that they believed that they were the first one to call. Um, the caller itself provided their name um, to 911 dispatcher or law enforcement, um, and they did not seek medical assistance during the execution of a search warrant, <clears throat> um, an arrest warrant, or other lawful search. Um, within that, the evidence that was collected could not be used for prosecution that was described in C3. And as the manager stated, under C3, um, less than a gram of cocaine and less than a gram of heroin were included. Both of those are felonies, no matter how minute amount that you have. Um, there was also a section that listed misdemeanor violation of General Statute 9095, subsections A3, which covers all narcotics. Um, and then a violation of 90-113.22, which is any drug paraphernalia that was collected at the scene. Um, <clears throat> Since then, I have found, uh, going back to the, the, the bill itself back in the day, uh, in 2013 when it was first uh, brought forth, there was also a section under there that provided civil liability to, to law enforcement, that if we were acting in good faith at a scene and something was collected and a charge was there, we could not be held civilly liable as well. So there's some good portions in there. It appears from when I was looking, I found that the uh, bill uh, by Representative I believe out of Wake County tried to draft new uh, sections of it in 2021, but it was never passed. Within that, subsection C3 just stated 
a violation of 9095A3, which you could have any narcotic, any amount, didn't matter. They struck out the misdemeanor, um, and then they took out <clears throat> the less than a gram of heroin and less than a gram of cocaine because it was leading back up to the just a violation of 9095, and then they just also had a violation of 90-11322, uh, which is drug paraphernalia. So those were the only two things that were in there. Um, I've also learned that maybe there's some <coughs> Other changes that are being proposed for immunity to everyone at the scene um, and then adding campus security to those that can be called since they don't strictly fall under law enforcement if the college or campus is not large enough that they have a campus police that's under training and standards through the uh, Department of Justice of North Carolina. Um, it looked as if they wanted to add fentanyl. Um, they state new substance. Fentanyl's been around for a while. Um, I guess it wasn't as popular or not being as seen as much back in 2013. Um, and adding the fentanyl and other drugs broadly without confusing carve outs for certain substances and amounts. And then they look at death by distribution charges, not having that allowed to where you can charge. Um, <coughs> these items here. I think immunity for everyone at the scene, um, I think that's a good idea. We're, it's not like we're going to <clears throat> overdoses where there's 25 and 50 people in. It's two, three, four, five people. Um, so it's not a big concern to, to add immunity for everyone, in my opinion. Um, campus security, I think that's, that's a good thing as well. So somebody could call for smaller uh, campuses <coughs> that have uh, certified law enforcement, like I explained earlier. The fentanyl and the death by distribution, I would just add to use caution on those, in my opinion. Um, we all know that fentanyl is, is becoming a narcotic that's causing the overdoses. Um, cocaine and heroin are there, but it's because they're mixed with the fentanyl. The cocaine and heroin, what we're seeing on the streets is rarely causing an overdose. It's the fentanyl that's mixed with it. Um, we know that fentanyl can be 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine and then 30 to 50 more times powerful than heroin itself. If you're adding any of those, I would strongly suggest that an amount be listed. If we're being preached upon that it's 100 times more and you're allowing a gram of heroin, should we not make it one one hundredth of a gram? being that it's that powerful. The DEA says that as little as two milligrams of fentanyl can be a fatal dose to most people. That's one one thousandth or two one one thousandths of a gram. So that shows how small of an amount of fentanyl and how powerful it is. Um, I would just use some caution um, instead of just having the broad amounts of 9095 in there. Talk to me more about the death by distribution provision. Death by distribution has come up in the last, I believe, three or four years. Mm -hmm. And from our side, it's hard to prove. Yeah. Um, and going back at the scene, we're not seeing that the distribution person, the dealer, so to speak, is at the scene of the overdose. Right. From talking to our narcotics officer, we charged it twice. Now, knock on wood, we don't have overdoses daily here. And glad for that, but death by distribution is extremely hard to prove. Mm -hmm. When they do build a case, it's never been anyone that has been at the scene. They're going through and getting records from cell phones through search warrants, talking to other people that were there, um, talking to associates that know these people mm -hmm. that lead them to where they were obtaining the narcotic from. And a lot of times that person's not even from our county. Right. They're coming in from from other areas. And then two years ago, our narcotics detective uh, was able to convict one federally um, from an overdose that we had on the northern part of town. Um, so it's very rare. Um, I don't see that that's a big concern in, in my eyes and from talking to our narcotics uh, officers um, where that would need to be struck out of that. Because right. right now we can still charge, but it's, it's very rarely that we do. And like I said, it's, it's usually not the person that's at the scene with them. Mm -hmm. If somebody is there, this law was brought into effect. There was a big 
uh, when this came out, we were seeing people were calling. That's what we want. We want people to be able to call for help. We're there to help you too, um, but we also are looking at all other avenues as well. I suppose start down this way, Commissioner Sears. I have no questions. Commissioner Cahoon. Commissioner Brinkley. Just if I may, when this law first came out, obviously I was still working, and I think it's a great law. It gives people, they're not going to be scared to call law enforcement or first responders to come there and give aid mm -hmm. uh, to the person that's overdosing. With that being said, with updating or adding new changes or new, new parts to the Good Samaritan law, two things concern me. The, the amount that there's just, just any amount and then the death by distribution even though it's not charged very often when it is it's effective because in my opinion it sends a message to those that <clears> are continue to deal in it that if we can get you you're gonna go to jail right and I think that having that as well as the charges that are exempt it's like the chief said you're not finding the person that sold it to him still be in there that's right so uh, I would uh, caution be hesitant to endorse those two items, but other than that, good. Thank you. Okay. Bob, well, I agree 100 percent. Okay. <clears throat> so what I would suggest then is that we do something like, if we would, mm -hmm. construct a letter with those reservations mm -hmm. and um, and we can reference, if we wish, the resolution that said or the or the wall. You, you know that. Updating law is a good good thing. Uh, we generally endorse you know, resolution resolution supported by our sister communities, but we have reservations about these items, um, and that we send that letter. And I would make a motion to that effect. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Sorry, keep here. Um, the next item is a request to vacate a portion of Turnstone Avenue. Uh, our engineer is back. Thank you, sir. Um, is there anything from staff before we hear from the engineer? We're we going to go straight to straight to the request. The, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I think the board is familiar with this property. It's just on the north side of the outlet mall. Uh, it's, an, it's a go-kart track, and I believe the owner would like to um, split it into two lots and potentially build single-family dwellings. Our right-of-way is right in the middle of the lot, and um, this would, this would sort of prevent the them from peering out to the sound. I believe that's the issue. They would like us to vacate the right-of-way. Uh, we included the provisions in the, in the uh, packet that explained to the board how that process works. Um, we have reservations about wholesale vacating the right of way. Uh, we've talked about a boardwalk in this area at some point in the future. Not sure if the town is at, is ready to do that, but it would, would allow us to do it at some point in the future. So uh, we have concerns about vacating it. Perhaps we could talk to the property owners about an easement for peers. Um, that's essentially our take on this. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Good, good, afternoon. good afternoon. Excuse good, me. It good afternoon, me. Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Joe Anloff with Anloff Engineering. I'm here on behalf of Deal Engineering. Andy Deal is traveling, and we've been working on this project for the property owner. And it is, it, what is planned there is two single-family residential dwellings. Property is bifurcated by Turnstone right away, which is comprised of waters governed by the state and marsh. And our biggest issue is access to the sound. We can access that small body of water that is at the north end of Turnstone, but that water is shallow and not navigable. So we're looking to get an elevated wooden walkway out to that portion of the sound that would allow them access to the water. <coughs> And so that is the root of our issue, and that is the genesis of our request for the abandonment. Of course, I'm sure my client would be willing to consider any number of alternatives, easements, anything's really on the table at this point. If you have any other questions, I'd be glad to answer them for you. Okay. All right. 
Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, we'll start down here. Commissioner Sanders, do you have questions? I don't. Huh? Commissioner Brinkley. Commissioner Cahoon. Comment. I find that a very ironic spot for two single family houses. <laughs> <laughs> I just really do. Especially after your local realtor, Bobby Harrell, said that is the worst place to build two single family houses. That, that's just amazing to me that they're going to take commercial property in a highly trafficked area and put. My comments will be, I'm not in favor of giving up a right of way. <laughs> can, can we give an easement so they can cross the property? I have no idea, no, no problem with that. Yeah. But I'm reserving our rights to use the right of way. Sure. Yeah. sure. Yeah. Can we give an easement? Yeah, the town, the town is the authority to grant an easement um, across its right of way here. I think the, the, the key thing would be drafting it in such a way that it would restrict them from doing anything that would impede the town's use of the right of way here. Um, I mean, obviously, it's hard to imagine that it would without there being any other use by the town at this time. But if the town were to improve this area, um, you know, you want to make sure that you would not be um, you would not be restricted from how you can use it because of the easement that you grant. So, but I think that the answer is yes. The town has the authority to grant it, but I think it's a matter of how to draft um, what the town would be willing to give, so as it, as not to in, in, impede uh, the town's ability to use this area. Yeah, a question about that. So if we create language to grant an easement and we we think that we may put a boardwalk through there or whatever, we would not normally review plans for a single family residence. Could we, within that language, request the right to review the peer design just so that we could see structurally what it looked like and make sure that it wasn't gonna, yeah, would it either be compatible with a future boardwalk or not? I think so. I think you could do it, particularly if you did this as an, an, an agreement by which this easement is granted, you could put various provisions in it such as that. Okay. Commissioner Kennedy. My comment would be, if we were to do a boardwalk and they've got walkways, are they going to be prepared for the amount of intrusion on their... Yeah. I mean, it's going to be... People so, are going to be wanting to access their pier if, if there's a boardwalk through there. So yeah. what comes to mind if, if you've been on Moore Shore, the bike path between... Uh, I think it's windswept and um, I can't more sure road itself. There's a, a concrete bicycle path that traverses that area and there's property owners to the east of it and they have elevated wooden walkways out to the sound and they have gates that say private. And so it precludes people from that use that multi-purpose path from, from ingress and egress onto those. And that's, that's the best they're gonna be able to do. I, I would believe that my client would move forward with his plans to get a camera permit for an elevated wooden walkway, probably ahead of maybe a town boardwalk. So we would need to take that scheduling into account. You know, you, you'd want to see it ahead of time right. and maybe not knowing all the details of what your board, boardwalk would include. They would have to send notice to the adjacent property owner and we would be the adjacent property owner for their, in the middle of their property. Yeah. Right, right. That I'm familiar with that stretch of Moore Shore Road. We ride through there a yeah. lot, and I, that was what came to mind as soon as, as soon as we started talking about this, is gates on both, you know, if the boardwalk went through, just gates on the piers on both sides so that there's no intrusion. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Brinkley. Yeah, good. Commissioner Sanders. I, I, if the board is inclined to agree to this, I would, rec I would suggest that you allow us a chance to draft an agreement um, and perhaps uh, have Mr. Hobbs talk with Mr. Anloff about that and see if we can, if they can agree upon something that seems to carry out these wishes and then bring that back for the board to approve. Uh, yes. So. I make that motion. Okay. <laughs> I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's weird. It's really weird. It is. All right. Um, that brings us to uh, consideration of an MOU between Nags Head and Kildwell Hills regarding building inspector <clears throat> mutual aid. All right. Uh, so last item here. Actually, there's one more after this. I apologize. Oh, too um, we have an MOU with Kildwell Hills currently uh, to allow the town of Nags had building inspectors to inspect buildings within the town of Kittleville Hills. 
that agreement does not allow their inspectors to come and inspect things in Nags Head. Um, I believe it was done uh, at one point in time when they didn't have uh, inspectors with, with certain certifications to be able to complete inspections, I believe on the Lowe's building. Um, so there wasn't a need at the time to uh, allow them to come to Nags Head. This would be a reciprocal agreement that would allow both towns to inspect in each other's jurisdiction. And um, we don't necessarily have a need for this right away. As the board knows, we are down one inspector. Uh, we seem to be faring fairly well with uh, one inspector. We are looking for an inspector. Um, however, we may need this at some point. Um, he needs time off, you know, he, he gets sick perhaps. And so we think this is uh, something that we'd, we'd like to have. Kill all the hills is agreeable to this. And so uh, we're just asking for the boards to, board to approve it. Board. So no questions for Andy, then a motion would be in order. Motion to adopt. Can I get this presented? I have a motion. Is there second. a second? I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. <clears throat> Andy, you said you had one more item? Yes, thank you. And I may ask for uh, Public Works, Public Services Director Nancy Carowin and also maybe David Ryan to assist with this. Uh, and I apologize, this just popped up. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. However, we, we have a property owner who owns property on Gallery Row uh, that was looking for a building permit from the planning department. In the review of the application, we discovered that there's not actually water service to this property. Um, Nancy can explain a little bit more of the history of Gallery Row and what they knew existed and what they knew did not exist. However, uh, in these cases in the past, this is how we've handled the extension of water service to the property, and it has required board action. So uh, what we're asking the board to do is consider this agreement, which would allow us to extend water to the property, and then they would essentially uh, reimburse us for that, um, the cost of that. And um, we did not want to hold up their permit uh, having to wait for another board meeting. So we, got, we tried to get this on the agenda today. And so um, if you have any questions, I think they'd be better answered by Nancy or David, perhaps. Board questions? Where Mike? Do the lines run Memorial and Virginia Dare? I mean, this. Could you come up, Nancy? Could you come up? Yes. <laughs> the line runs from Wrightsville to Memorial down Gallery Road, but it does not go from Memorial to the Beach Road mm -hmm. on that piece of property. The houses, um, there's a house that faces Virginia Dare Trail, so that's where he gets his water from. Mm -hmm. There's a house that faces Gallery Row, mm -hmm. but he's tapped off of uh, Memorial. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that is a new piece of property that got split. I, I don't know. Um, so what do we do on Driftwood, where that house is right directly behind this? Is there a line that runs down Driftwood? I believe it does. Because that's the same configuration as this. There are several um, spots in the town that we've identified um, and through the years have been making connections and like the one from Soundside Road to Danube. Um, from Bonnet to Baltic. Uh, from Windjammer to Villa Dunes. We are, Trump, we are addressing the issues of no water lines to make sure everything's continuing that we did not, have not gotten this one. I think the last one was in 2012 that they had the incident on Abilene Street.
And you would run your water line from? Um, the property owner would run his water line from uh, Memorial to the east part of his property. And then the town, to, to keep it going, to tie it into the beach road, would take it from there to the beach road. So the property owner would be responsible for memorial to his property and the town would take one from the end of his property to the beach road in order to make it a loop? Yes, ma'am. And the total cost for the whole thing is? I believe it's like, um, say, 55, 56. He's got uh, 32,000 some and we have uh, 20, say 22,000. So you're requiring him to carry to the east corner of his lot? To the far part of his lot. If he was tapping from Memorial. Uh, Virginia, if he was tapping from Memorial to the farthest end of his property, if he was tapping from Virginia Dare, he would take it to the other stream. Okay. So you're giving him the shorter of the two instead of adding an extra seventy five feet to him. He's got 150 feet to the corner of the back road of the Virginia property that he would carry it to. What you said? I know, well, you're not looking at the same map I'm looking at, so it's difficult. No, I was, um, David had wrote, and it may be included in the, the breakdown of how much the homeowner would be responsible for and how much the town would be responsible for. And I, it shows how many feet that he's responsible for, and I believe he was responsible for more. For 150 plus the, the right of way off of Memorial, or is it, do you know if it's on the west side of Memorial or the east side of Memorial? It's on the west side of Memorial. It's so got to go a, under the road. Another 50 foot. Is this is this it here where it says that um, $21,252 would be the town's portion, and then $32,556 would be his portion? Okay. Um, two. Just thinking about the cost for the homeowner and alternatives. Um, if it were not for this condition that we have found, that we have one property that doesn't have water in front of it, do we necessarily need the water line going down Galway Row? I mean, what what I'm wondering is, like, if if we let the guy have a meter up by the beach road and ran a two-inch line down the right of way to the house. I mean, well, in the past we found that for a fire flow, it's um, the minimum is a six-inch line. Zero. This is three Would a hydrant be added anywhere along here? No, because yeah. there's one on Memorial and then there's one on um, Beach Road. So a hydrant would not be required <coughs> at that stretch. Would that be a, would it be a six inch line though, right? Yes, sir. Right. Yes. Wow. And the cost is high, but in the past two years, Everything's gone up, especially with plastic and uh, supply demand. And right. Is this a requirement in our code for a six-inch line? And then to extend it to the east, to the the furthest point of the property. I believe so. It's in. It's common in most other towns to extend to the other opposite side from where it's coming from. Hmm. Well, I'm not hearing an alternative. So, hey, what action is actually required of us? To approve the agreement. Okay. 
can if, uh, if, if I can provide a little bit of uh, background um, uh, mr. mayor you had asked could we go ahead and basically tie into one of those existing distribution mains either on South Memorial Avenue or South Virginia Dare Trail well I think that is the way that the town used to manage that and I think they found some shortcomings to that so back in 2004 the town instituted a policy to say if you fall within one of these gaps then yes you're going to have to put in a distribution line which then carries it to the far end of your line and so that's really what's driving all this is that we've got a separate water line policy that specifically addresses this situation thank you well i mean that that helps me because regardless of the misfortune of this owner <laughs> we had a policy in the books they bought a lot where they discovered there was no water line okay they go back to their realtor since they were it was presented as having municipal water Mike? Okay. yeah i just looked and this is not the first time this has happened. It happened back in 2012 on Abalone Street where you had to go through the same process. So this agreement is really um, is, is copied off of what we had done previously um, with that other application. And basically these costs, these, these are probable construction costs. So if the, the actual construction costs come in under that, then yes, the owner will be reimbursed with that difference. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I make a motion to approve the agreement as presented. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, all right. Then that brings us to the Board of Commissioners agenda. And I'm lost. I think I should go down. Nope. I started with Bob. Commissioner Sears. I have nothing publicly. Commissioner Cahoon. A um, couple things. One is I'm very appreciative to Fred Smith Company that's doing our paving on 158. They seem to be doing a really good job. And I'm really appreciative that they cleaned up the road shoulders as they went along. Because when I look through Kitty Hawk, it's horrible. They let, the other contractor left all the dirt. dirt over there, and when the water rains, the water's not going to run off the road like it should. So I'm very pretty, that's one. So I'm just very appreciative that they yeah. seem to be and doing And they're moving it. along. I they mean, are moving along. along the other is, and I mentioned this, um, is I'd like to take a, a look at glass recycling mm -hmm. um, and the concept of um, possibly grinding it down to sand. I hope Commissioner Saunders will take a look at this. Is um, in Louisiana, they're taking that sand that they've ground down from glass that was just going in landfills, putting it in burlap bags, and are using it back to rebuild their estuarine shoreline with plantings and so forth. Because there's not enough oyster reefs in North Carolina to have an oyster reef everywhere we go. No, there's not. But uh, the possibility of using sand may give us another source of material to build some of these um, structures that we want to reconstruct our shoreline with. Did you get to check with the county manager about I that? did. They still have their glass um, tumbler. I also mentioned it to Coastal Management last week, and they're going to take a contact the state of Louisiana and find out about it um, to see if there's any byproduct problem with it going into the, it's going into the Gulf of the Mexico there, right. and they're using it where they've had a lot of erosion and scouring right. from you know canals and stuff. But um, it looks like to me it might be a beneficial use Yes. And it would be a good way for us to take glass out of the landfill. Because yeah. um, I know we, our ABC people recycle, but that's not enough. But if you could get enough to make a difference in this area, and even in the state of North Carolina, yes. to do something, because um, everybody has subsidence or sea level rise and yeah. shoreline erosion, that yeah. it might be something to take a look at and add another tool to our toolbox. I think it's a great idea. Um, so, like I said, I did ask last week. They're going to contact the state, and the county. They are reached, their county is still using their tumbler, as I call it a tumbler. But okay. um, it's something we might want to take another look at. Do you at. know about how much, like, tumbled glass they produce a week or a month or anything? Like that? I don't. I'm sure it's more in the summertime than it is this time sure. of year. Um, but I'd just be um, curious. That'd be a. I'd ask that the manager take it to the county manager at manager's luncheon. <coughs> We kind of take a look at that and get some information and see if we can combine, combine some sort of information fact sheet. Yep. 
And the only other thing I had was uh, June is rapidly approaching, and uh, I look at how many new people we have working for the town in Hackshead, and it might be time to dust off not our EOC plan, but our after storm plan, which talks about people that contractors that we have on a list and different things. And it might, we've got new people on the board that probably don't even know what it is. And it might be time for the board to take a look at it as well as, you know, new staff to be involved. Right, I agree. We, we are actually getting ready to update our emergency operations plan. We've had an RFQ out there for a little while. Um, we had grant funds to uh, get a consultant to help us do a comprehensive update to that. But you know, last summer we did do a tabletop exercise with the Dare County Emergency Management staff. They helped our staff walk through an exercise, so we did some practice on our emergency operations plan. You know, it might be good to, to do something with the board at a board meeting just to kind of go over some of the things the board might have to deal with. Well, I bring it up because as we talk about nonconformities, buildings burning, mm -hmm. um, if we were to have a major hurricane, there's a plan in place that may need a lot of updates about how we redevelop mm -hmm. after a storm. Mm -hmm. And it would need input from new people yep. sitting here because the plan is that old. We had, we had sections of our code that dealt with storm reconstruction. Yeah, so I would just ask that bring all the board members up to current specs on that. Okay. All right. Thank you. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Just briefly, we had Miss Heat well speak this morning yes um, I see on the request for closed session from town attorney Whitey that that item is going to be discussed and I know that the managers had a good relationship standing communication with them and I hope that that continues there she mentioned the stop stencils that the town does and you know that we overdid it well that to me is another safety feature uh, that sometimes catches people's attention versus the stop sign and uh, I appreciate that the town has continue to to install those I think it's a it's a it's a good feature to add to our town roads yeah facilities maintenance I think just got finished doing that town-wide adding the stop bars and the stop markings it's funny because I got stopped I think well I think it was you that told me we did that in Nagshead Acres and everybody thought we weren't going to pay because we because we redid the markings right. <laughs> <laughs> we had to reassure them that's all okay thank you Mr. Sam you know Mr. Mayor um a couple of things for me uh, real quick, um, nothing major, but um, Kate Jones and I attended the RISE conference in Greenville yesterday. Um, it had a lot of funders from the state um, agencies, groups like Golden Leaf and others talking about all the money that's available. Um, and then a series of speakers and um, attendees who address various issues that have arisen um, through all these funding opportunities and construction projects and there were some good there were some good um, opportunities there that um, Kate probably came back with some notes um, I texted Andy during because I when Golden Leaf said that they would flood um, uh, give grants for no with no match for flood control I immediately texted Andy and Andy said we've applied for the project in uh, old Max had place so we've actually applied for the money some money that go and we've we're had we're working on the we're grant. working on the grant application but yeah we had identified it and we well it, because David gave a presentation to the board I believe a month ago on the old Nax had place project and yeah. there was a gap in funding right. and so the board had asked us to go back and look at other sources and so we identified that and we had the opportunity so I think Amy was working with Hunter at McAdams to get get an application in for that. Okay, and they do a rolling process, so every two months they make grant, uh, they, they do grant, so we we would know something fairly shortly. And they have a ton of money. And they have a lot of money, uh, and they really are looking to give it away. So so that was a, a really good conference. Um, the other issue we mentioned building inspectors this morning. Um, and it's come up at the, the mayor's luncheons, the sort of lack of building inspectors and the fact that we have them sort of moving back between it, back and forth between ourselves. So I've talked to the League of Municipalities. They've heard it as a problem from some of their towns. I talked to um, the local home builders association. Um, I have talked to um, COA, 
uh, about offering classes. Um, so, um, and I've talked to the, the air chapter of the AIA in Raleigh, and so I'm just touching all the bases. I don't know that there's an answer yet, but um, I am trying to figure out if there's a way for the for the state, or at least for us, to have a few more building inspectors available. I think the county, I saw the county manager last week at Coastal Management, and he mentioned that he was gonna bring something forward to the uh, manager's luncheon too, okay. to talk about it. Okay, so just trying to make a little bit of progress there on, on building inspectors. <coughs> that brings us to closed sessions, and recalling that we added one, um, Mr. Lighty, I'll let you add, um, if you'll give us the language for someone to um, so move. Yes, sir, and I understand there's two different uh, property acquisition issues, and so I'm going to list both of those. Um, so we need a motion to go into closed session as allowed by General Statute 143-318.11A3 in order to consult with the town attorney regarding matters uh, within the attorney-client privilege and to preserve that privilege, including the uh, Town versus Cherry, Inc., and uh, town versus Bud Long litigation matters, as well as pursuant to general statute uh, 143-318.11A5 uh, in order to discuss the potential acquisition of real property located at um, 2914 South Virginia Dare Trail and um, 100 East Hollowell. All right, someone will make a motion to so that. Moved. I'm sorry, you have to repeat the whole motion, Mr. <laughs> That's what we pay you. That's what you and Carolyn are for. <laughs> have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> right, thank you. The board will be in aye. recess. board has returned to open session. Mr. Lighty, will you please report? Yes, Mr. Mayor, the board did discuss various uh, uh, confidential um, and privileged matters with the town attorney, did give some instruction to the town attorney, uh, also discussed real estate matters, but no uh, further actions were taken that have to be disclosed at this time. Okay. All right. Um, it has um, been resolved um, in discussion among the commissioners that the workshop planned for today uh, is best. Uh, tabled and conducted on March 15th. And so we need a motion to recess to a workshop at 9 a.m. on March the 15th. So moved. Would it be also a meeting? Yes. A motion, uh, yes, a workshop and a meeting. Uh, thank you. And I have a motion from Commissioner Brinkley. Is second. It, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thank you. Thank you.